As a traveling convention planner, I stay at many hotels over the course of a year. I spend about a week per trip in an all-expense played suite of my choosing, doing nothing but studying the location and interviewing the staff on hand to get a feel for the hotel and its traffic. I then spend another week organizing the event and ensuring my client is satisfied with my plans. There's a little more to it, but that's the overall gist of the job. If you can get over the constant jet lag, it's not a bad gig. In all of my years of planning conventions, I must have stayed at over a hundred different hotels. With similar floor plans, architecture and staff training, they all blend together in my mind, but one in particular will always stay with me. The Grovewood Inn, located just on the outskirts of Cape Cod. That one kept me up for many nights, even after I left. At first, my trip to Grovewood Inn seemed mostly forgettable. The convention I was planning was a glorified book club meeting for a group of older women and some local authors. The service, food and layout of the hotel were average and unexciting. The only thing I liked about the place was Clara, the desk clerk. I'd have even asked her out on a date had she not been married. I had planned boring conventions before and had been to many subpar hotels, but this trip was remarkably mind-numbing. I couldn't wait to be done with it. One night at the inn, after a long day of mundane event planning, I flipped on the TV, poured a glass of wine and climbed into bed. I grabbed the program guide from my bedside table and looked it over, hoping to find the adult networks. As I glanced at the channel listings, something at the bottom of the page caught my eye. Written crudely in permanent marker was the following. Elevator code 030806B10402. Zero seven B two zero five zero one. This was odd. I knew of hotels that had pin pads on their elevators, usually to prevent children from using them, but the Grovewood Inn was not one of them. Plus, most pin pad elevators only required a four digit code. Intrigued, I decided to call up the front desk to find out more. I was sure the code would turn out to be something trivial and uninteresting, but it was, at the very least, an excuse to talk to Clara again. Though unreciprocated, I enjoyed flirting with her, if for no other reason than to hear her infectious laughter. A sip of wine and a few failed pickup lines later, I was back at square one. Clara didn't know anything about it, claiming there was no device in the entire building that would require a code like that, much less one of the elevators. She did, however, point out that the numbers in the code and lined with every floor of the hotel. 1 through 8, plus the two basement levels. We both found this odd, but ultimately couldn't make sense of it. After getting off the phone with Clara, my curiosity got the better of me. I left my room, walked over to the elevator and stepped inside. I then pressed the buttons in the order they were written on my channel guide, just to see if anything would happen. Much to my disappointment, the elevator did nothing but take me to every floor of the hotel, before finally stopping at the lobby. The front desk was in eye shot of the elevator, so I quickly hit the button for my floor, not wanting to explain to Clara what I was up to. Though I didn't have a shot with her, it still would have been embarrassing to tell her I was spending my night playing around in the elevator. Luckily, I was able to escape unseen. Upon stepping foot back on my floor, I noticed a member of the cleanup crew walking down the hall. That's when it hit me. The staff never used the patron elevators. They had their own service elevator to get from floor to floor without impeding the travel of guests. It may sound ridiculous, but I needed to know if the code worked in that elevator, if for no other reason than to placate my undying curiosity. I inconspicuously made my way down the hall, heading to the service elevator. Once there, the familiar sting of disappointment set in. A staff card was required to gain access no doubt to keep guests from using it. Feeling defeated and realizing how crazy I was letting boredom make me, I walked back to my room. After a few more glasses of wine, I drifted off and entered a long, peaceful, alcohol-induced slumber. I awoke many hours later to sunlight flooding my room and the familiar sound of a vacuum next door. Cleanup is always in full force early in the mornings at hotels, 
When the initial grogginess of waking up wore off, something came to mind. Something that caused me to jump to my feet and immediately exit my room. There, in the middle of the hall, was a cleaning cart, and there was no staff in sight. Hanging from a lanyard was the maid's staff card, ripe for the taking. This was it. This was my chance. Maybe it was a slight hangover I had, or perhaps it was the true monotony of planning a less than exciting convention. But I grabbed that card and ran to the service elevator like it was the last chance I had of having some adventure during my trip. Something about that code was calling to me. It was a mystery I desperately felt the need to solve. Upon swiping the maid's card and entering the elevator, I quickly punched in the code and waited. At first, nothing happened. The elevator didn't move, but the buttons all remained illuminated. I thought that maybe I'd somehow busted the thing, but the preceding moments proved this theory wrong. Without warning, the elevator raced up the heights of the hotel, ascending much faster than normal. The digital readout above counted the floors up to eight, and then kept going until it reached twelve. This was bizarre as the Grovewood Inn only had eight floors and there was no discernible reason why the elevator should have been able to reach that height. By all accounts, I would have been in the sky by that point. After a few moments, the elevator door opened, revealing behind it a grand ballroom, the likes of which I'd never seen before in any of the hotels I'd been to. Victorian era chandeliers hung from the ceiling, beautiful silk banners danced from wall to wall, and hundreds of people dressed in old-fashioned attire and elegant faced wear waltzed about as a giant band played a catchy tune. My jaw was on the floor. It's hard to explain, but a romantic fog filled the air. I watched as masked patrons danced in unison and partook in lavish festivities, completely oblivious to my presence. For a moment or two, I completely forgot about the hotel below, awestruck by the scene before me. Something about it was absolutely intoxicating. Just as I was about to step out of the elevator, the music stopped. All at once, the ballroom guests turned around to face me and held their gaze with mine, almost as if peering into my very soul. It became quickly apparent that I was not welcome there, an uninvited and unwanted visitor in a room I was never supposed to reach. It was clear to me that it was time to leave. I tried pressing the button for the lobby, but it wouldn't light up. I tried floors two, three, and four. No dice. The elevator was stagnant, and I was trapped. I looked back over to the crowd, and to my horror, they began walking in my direction. The march was slow, but without a working elevator, I had no means of escape. I was at the mercy of the ballroom and its occupants now, no matter what that fate entailed. With little in the way of options, I attempted to converse with the group. Who are you? What do you want with me? My query was met with little reaction. The only response I received was the continued sound of footsteps on the ballroom floor. Frightened of what was about to come next, I backed up as far as the elevator walls would allow, a mouse cornered in a bird's cage. Just as the vultures closed the gap between us, an explosion of fire emerged from the background, overcoming the guests and engulfing the entire room in flames. I began to cough uncontrollably from the toxic smoke that loomed above. Beads of sweat the size of pearls dripped down my cheek. To top it off, the guests were still there, standing still at the foot of the elevator, somehow unfazed by the fiery heat around them. In between coughs, I managed to offer one last question, though I knew it would probably go unanswered. What do you want? The woman at the front of the crowd stepped forward. She wore a fox mask and a slight grin, though her lips would soon spread apart to speak. We want to be saved. At this moment, the flames took flight, rising to the highest heights of the ballroom. Molten skin dripped from the woman's frame like candle wax, as her features morphed into a gruesome arrangement of congealed flesh and bubbling blisters. Won't you save us? In a grotesque slur of a natural movement, the woman stumbled in my direction, 
arms outstretched. I stood still, in terror, as her burnt fingers made their way to my neck. Just as she was about to make contact, the door shut behind her and the lights went out. The bulb in the elevator, the fire in the ballroom. It was all gone. The energy around me had dissipated abruptly, leaving nothing but pitch blackness in its place. Somehow, I was alone. A few moments of confusion passed, followed by a loud roar from the elevator shaft below. All at once, everything sprung back to life, save for my fox-masked assailant. As the elevator dropped, I watched the digital readout count backwards from 12. Eventually, I was back in familiar territory, safe and sound on the ground floor. Before the doors could fully open, I made a mad dash for the front desk. Clara! Hey, what's got you so frazzled? And what are you doing in the service elevator? If I had told her what I'd seen, she'd think I was crazy. Instead, I composed myself and asked for some information. Did this hotel ever have a 12th floor? Clara looked very surprised by my question. Yes, it did. The Grove Road Inn was originally almost twice its height, but a lot of it burned up in a bad fire, so it had to be reconstructed. The top floor was a ballroom, but that was very much a long time ago. She pointed at a framed picture on the wall behind her, dated 1913. Why do you ask? No reason, just curious, that's all. I promptly made my way back to my room and reflected on everything. I wondered if I'd seen the picture without realising it and dreamed up my elevator escapade. I discarded this thought rather quickly, sure that I was wide awake when it happened. I thought it might have been something in the wine, but that was equally unlikely. There was no logical explanation for what occurred. And that's about it. I never found out exactly what happened that day in the hotel. I mustered up enough courage to try the code again, but it didn't work. It seems I was allowed a one-time glimpse into the past, a look at what was before and what might still be today had the hotel not been partially destroyed. I only wish I could have taken part in the festivities before things went sour. Perhaps I could have somehow prevented the fire and saved the patrons, just like the fox mask woman wanted. All I can do now is look back on that day, completely bewildered, as I plan my next convention. I was an exterminator, and my last job has driven me to early retirement. That pretty much sums up the story. Have you ever seen those shows where they send in people in hazmat suits to clean up the crap piled mountains of hoarded garbage? Yeah, well, that was me. On top of deep cleaning homes, I had the lovely job of exterminating the swarms of pests that thrived in those conditions. I've seen things you wouldn't imagine. Bathtubs filled with roaches, living and dead laid on top of each other like a crunchy crawling lasagna. Oh, and there was this one time when me and my partner Phil went into a house with, and I quote, a small rat problem. Let me tell you, there was nothing small about them. They were like rats on roids. Phil even joked, he saw he saw one with a teardrop tattoo and a switchblade. I digress. The reason I'm telling you all this is so you understand, so you can tell that I'm just an average Joe. Literally, my name is Joe, and I'm a sane, straight-shooting, working-class bloke. That's important, you see, for what I'm about to tell you will make you question the validity of my story. But I swear to you that it is the honest truth. About a week ago, we got a call for a job just outside of Kansas. It was a little farmstead, with the owner complaining about a vermin problem. Rats? No problem, I thought when Phil told me. I mean, having dealt with cat-sized roid rats, I was pretty sure I could handle whatever pests were running amok on a farm. Besides, Phil had assured me that this was going to be an easy job. I had no reason to think he'd be wrong. So, we went out to the home of a woman who called, a Mrs. Kedderwell. Across the acrid wastes we drove, and upon driving up the dirt road, I could see it. A little farm with a crooked, crudely crafted windmill spinning slowly beside it, 
The place was quaint, like a dream of yesteryear that never were. It was the sort of place one would imagine as a backdrop to a black and white western, where troubles melted like lemon drops and twisters delivered you to far off strange new worlds. However, there was also something off about the place. From its fields of dried yellow grass and barren soil, to the enormous barn, its red paint faded and its interior empty of animals. The cogs began to spin in my head and I found myself wondering what kind of farm is this if it doesn't have any animals or crops. Still, maybe they used to run it as a farm, but I've retired it since, I told myself. Yeah, that seemed logical to me. Maybe they ran it and it's since gotten too old and let it slip into disrepair. It happens. When we parked the van up, I looked at the home ahead. It was a teetering, two-floored structure, a gnarled, crudely constructed wooden homestead, made of uneven planks and entirely stripped of his exterior painting, probably from a lifetime of battering by the harsh and sand-filled winds. You're not one of those salesmen, or those who keep trying to take my home? A shrewd, elderly voice squawked from the shadows of a porch. No, madame, we're from Squeaky Clean, the pest control and house cleaning service, Phil said, stepping his portly body up onto the porch his large workman boots causing it to creak as he did. Oh, of course you are, and I may say, you seem like a sweet young man. Are you here to deal with a vermin? The shriveled old lady asked, her toothless wrinkled mouth grinning at Phil. I followed in Phil's wake and looked at the shrewd little old woman, all wrinkled up and wrapped in layers of knitted fabric. Yeah, that's right, we came because of the rodent problem you've been having, I assured her. Looking at her, with her small black glasses pressed into her face like goggles, and the layers of knitted shrouds wrapped around her, I wondered if she was all there. Oh, there seems to be no end to them. They are everywhere these days. But lately, they've been scampering in and out of my house as if they own it. They were always coming on my property, touching my things, squeaking away. I've put down traps, but they still keep coming, trying to force me out. Mrs. Kittlewell exclaimed, her strange rambling words bringing a smile to both mine and Phil's face. We were accustomed to the normal, dementia-dented declarations of our more senile clientele, but the idea of some rat conspiracy was a new one. You couldn't do me a favour, could you, young man? Could you also check on the flies? Mrs. Kettlewell asked, her voice interrupting my daydreams of William Wallace-styled rat rebellions. The flies? I shivered haven't gotten flashbacks to this awful squat that we had to clean a couple years back. No problem, Mrs. Kettlewell. We'll swat those flies and round up those rodents for you and have your home sparkling in no time. Phil chuckled in a charming corporate way. I'm too long in the tooth for you to patronize, young man. She snapped, her calm and gentle manner slipping for a moment. Phil and I gave each other the she's a Spanish short of a toolbox look as we cautiously planned our next phrases and replies. Anyway, I'll leave you boys to it. I'll be going into town to run some errands, but feel free to help yourself to what's in the pantry, the little woman said as she shuffled away towards a dusty, beetleboard banger parked on a dirt road. Oh, and one more thing. My son is sleeping in his room. He is not to be disturbed. Okay, Mrs. Kettlewell, I chimed back as we began our journey up into the house. That means don't enter his room. He gets very cross when that happens. She insisted a word serious and stern, like a teacher chastising a pupil. We promise, Phil replied, trying his best not to annoy the feisty little woman anymore. Then the woman drove off. We could still hear the cracks of a car engine sputtering the distance as we clad ourselves in gear and masked up. Then we did it. We peeled back the screen door and entered into the old woman's parlour. It was as bad as you can imagine. Cobwebs didn't just hang from the ceiling, they were practically a part of it. The white strands were strewn across the room, knitting themselves together with the old wooden furniture and the rat-bitten couch. The dust-heavy air was scented with the smell of stale winds and total neglect, but the kitchen was far worse. Upon stepping into the wretched room, we saw a wide breach in the floor, a plunge into a dark basement below. The counters were caked in layers of grime, and the fridge. My god, that fridge. We opened it, and out fell the Niagara Falls of maggots and other worming white things, 
wriggling in unison and undulating into the cracks between the floorboards. And you thought this job was going to be easy? I laughed. I giggled, giving Phil a playful nudge. Yeah, don't you just love our job? Phil laughed. Suddenly, our laughter was startled by the sound of horrid feet scuttling through the wood above us. The pitter-patter of tiny feet was something we were familiar with, having been in plenty of rat-infested hovels. I'll deal with our furry-footed friends upstairs, and you can handle all this, I said as I turned to leave. Oh, you're so kind, Phil said, shaking his head. Exiting the kitchen, I began climbing up the termite chewed steps, trying my best not to put too much weight on them, lest I fall straight through and end up in some godforsaken rat's nest. Tap, 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 drummed the verminous sounds around the house, their rhythmic tones a little off from the usual bouncy bounding of rats. However, rats were the least of my concerns once I put my foot down upon the top step. As I did, it hit me. The noxious odour. Earthy, yet sour, like soil from a field watered with curdled milk. It was the putrid perfume of death. I knew it well. When you've cleaned up as many scenes of death and murder, you get accustomed to the bitter rot that spills from the dead. Yet, you never get over the dread. I feared what might be waiting upstairs for me, knowing what that smell meant. With slow and cautious steps, I followed it, until I came to a room at the far end of a creaky, crumbling hallway. I was sure this was where the smell was coming from, and solidifying this assumption was a sound of buzzing behind the wooden membrane. The door before me vibrated with the wing beat of an infinitesimal swarm. Now, with the smell and flies, my mind was quick to race towards the idea that I was about to step foot into a crime scene. I mean, that lady wasn't all there to begin with. Maybe she snapped and killed her son, or maybe he died of natural causes and she just couldn't bear to part with his body. That theory filled me with revulsion and despair. I was used to cleaning up after the dead, but seeing one, especially a child, that thought chilled me to my bones. Still, I had a job to do, and Phil would love for me to chicken out so he can joke and howl at my expense. Readying my sprain hand and mustering up the courage to enter, I rushed in, slamming the door shut behind me. All was black. Even the light outside was eclipsed by the black bodies buzzing above the panes of glass. My visors were completely coated in them, and so, with no eyes to see, I unleashed a noxious spray into the air, sending the swarm into a futile frenzied flight. On I sprayed, until their numbers began to die down. It didn't take long before they fell still, and though there were still a lot struggling on, I could finally wipe my visors clean and see the room. To my surprise, there was nothing out of place. I mean, it was an empty room, no clutter, no hoard, no expired food or rotten corpse as I had imagined. Relief washed over me. But then, I heard it. The scuttling. This time, the tapping ran up, the wall to my right, drumming an arachnid beat as it did. A shiver ran up my spine upon hearing the sound. No amount of experience in this kind of job can ever cure you of the fear of spiders. I mean, they're spiders. Creepy, eight-legged hairy things that crawl into every tiny crevice or hole available. That idea freaks me out more than the thought of coming upon a dead body. I dread to see how big the spiders are here. I mean, they've got no shortage of food, I joke to myself. I often found that talking to myself helped me forget the fear of the little critters, but this time it didn't, as the heavy thumps of eight feet clattered back down the wall. With trembling hands, I tried to just get on with my job. I laid down flypaper, practically wallpapering the room with it to get any surviving flies, and as I was placing one sheet down, my eyes caught a glimpse of a strange stain. Trailing down the wall was a browning leak of something, it was behind a torn piece of wallpaper, and it was clear the stain was larger than what I could see. I realised I had missed it upon my first glance, because most of it was hidden behind the wallpaper of pink flowers which adorned the room. Something in me told me to peel the paper back. I know I shouldn't have, but once I began, I couldn't stop. With one final tear, the paper fell, and before my eyes, 
inches from my face was a large circular blob of brownish splatter. I touched the wall. It was moist. So moist my fingers almost spilled through it. Then it struck me again, a gust of foul festering fumes. There was certainly something rotting. Perhaps there was a body, and I was simply in the wrong room, I thought. Despite my instincts telling me something was off, I elected to enter the room next door. Once I left the swarming spare room, I walked towards the adjacent room, and upon the door, there was the phrase, Henry's room, engraved into the wood. My mind returned to Mr. Kettlewell's only request, and though a part of me should have been concerned with keeping it, I was more worried that her request was made so we would not discover the corpse of a son. With a deep breath, I turned the handle and let the door swing open. To my utter shock, what lay before me was the room of a small boy. Drawings adorned the walls, and there were boxes of action men and a ceiling dotted with glow-in-the-dark stars. However, there was one problem, one irregularity to sight. Every inch, every shelf and wooden furnishing was tied together, knotted in a cascade of greenish-brown webbing. This web was unlike any spiders I had ever seen. It wasn't even like the cobwebs from downstairs. It was thick, mucus-like, and it clung to everything, forming strange slime structures and weird worming nets. Entering, I began yanking some of the sticky stuff down, but it was pulling plaster out of the ceiling and walls, so I stopped and prepared to use my spray. Maybe that would loosen the threads, I thought. It was around this time that I noticed that sat atop a set of drawers were a series of photographs. Looking to the black and white pictures, I saw Mrs. Kettlewell, still old and wrinkled, but with a small, curly-haired boy. He looked no older than eleven in every picture and was always cuddled up to her, shrouded in throws and sheets. They were odd pictures. Something about the way every part of the boy was wrapped up in a quilt in every photo frame. It just struck me as peculiar. But then again, looking around the chamber of gangrenous webs, those photos were the least strange thing about the house. The penny finally dropped, and the most obvious, the most striking thing imaginable finally dawned upon me. Mrs. Kettlewell was adamant that this room contained a son, and though he was held in the picture frames, I saw no sign of the boy among the repulsive entanglement of slime threads. I raided my spray and began unleashing its toxic torrent into the room. Pouring forth, the spray cut through the threads, causing them to sizzle, spilling into puddles of puke-colored gunk. Scuttling suddenly ricocheted across the room, a frightened scampering, I thought, from a spider that was soon to snuff it. In my naivety and arrogance, I continued my fumigation, chasing the rattling vermin as it raced away from the bug-repellent chemicals. Spraying beneath the boy's bed, I struck whatever it was, causing the thing to unleash a screech. Never in my worst or weirdest nightmares have I ever heard a sound like it. A bitter, biting wail of a sound that roared like a cougar and hissed like a diamondback. Stunned by the noise, I stopped spraying, giving the creature the opportunity it needed. Scrambling behind the wardrobe, its legs skittered up the wood, knocking the wardrobe down as it rambled up its back. Fractured rotten strands and a cloud of dust filled the room, but when the debris cleared, I saw that behind the wardrobe was a great gaping hole. What kind of spider was that? I fretted. It surely had to be a rat, I told myself. Only something big could have knocked that wardrobe over, but then, if it wasn't a spider, what had created the vile vines of sickly silk which infested the room? Come on, you've got a job to do. It's just a bug. You've killed bugs before. I said, trying to psych myself up, but it wasn't working. Trembling, I picked up my spray and stepped through the man-sized cavity in the wall, carrying in with me the heavy canister. Cautiously, I walked through the dizzily twisted interior of the walls, trying not to slip or miss a sheer drop down. Like Henry's room, the space between was thick with an otherworldly, grotesque gossamer. Slowly, I trudged, weaving between the sickly strands until that smell, that fetid, disgusting reek hit me once more. It was stronger in here. It was all I could smell. Every breath I took was a lung full of pestilent perfume. 
I had no time to worry about the choking on the stench, for something had caught my eyes. In the webs ahead, I found something out of place. A card from a realtor. Beside it hung another card, this time for a law firm, and next to that, a card for another real estate agent. Looking around, these cards littered the place. Not just law firms or real estate agents either. Plumbers, babysitters, even pest control. Strange that there should be so many. Stranger still that they would be held between the walls. Then I saw them, clinging to sticky strands, entombed and partially cocooned in greenish brown, were bodies. Dozens of them. A horrified gasp left my mouth. Realtors, salesmen and lawyer types still wearing their fancy suits. They were strung up like parcels of goop. They were rotten, dissolving in a soup of themselves, dripping and seeping into every fibre and splinter. They were the smell, the brown stuff on the walls. That was them, melting away, rotting between the crooked panels and thin drywall. I let out a howl, bellowing out for Phil, but the moment I did, I heard it. The cracking of joints, the movement of many legs. To my horror, my eyes caught a glimpse of something. Atop one of the maggot-crawling corpses appeared a shape. Lunging forth, the ghastly spider slashed through the air with biting fangs and clawing legs. I ducked and ran, swiftly swerving through the webbing evading each clawing sweep from the spider's arms. Listening as I ran, all I could hear was the urgent and hungry scampering of spider legs bounding from wall to wall, closing in on me with each step. In the darkness, it was hard to see, but I knew that thing was far too large to be a normal spider. It was something else, something monstrous. Those ethereal webs were spun from otherworldly materials, and the murderous hunger that drove the thing had to come from some eldritch realm far from our famished thoughts. I dared not dream from whence it crawled, only focusing on the path ahead as I sprinted on. Pounding out from the murk of the wall cavity, I stumbled back and watched as leg by leg it emerged from the hole. With a sinister slowness, it crept from the shadows. Each leg was as long as a meter, murky green, the color of rot. Every limb was armor-plated in a segmented foul carapace, spiked and thorned with long black spiny hairs. However, the spidery limbs were not the worst reveal, for as it pulled itself forth from the shadows, all colour left my skin and all my bravery with it. Thundering, my heart almost tore itself from my chest as fear turned my bones and muscles to stone. Before me was not a spider. It had the legs of one, but its body was no arachnid. It was a head the head of a boy, specifically the boy from all Mrs. Kettlewell's photos. This monstrosity was Henry. Though it appeared like a severed head, the grinning child's aberrant appearance had no neck, and out of his head grew the hideous spider legs upon which it scuttled. There, there was no order to their positioning. Some bore out of its crown, others out of his ears or the back of its head. With wicked delight, his pale face spoke not a word from his dirty blackened mouth. Instead, his poison smile opened its jaw wide and revealed hundreds of curved, grey fang teeth. In a flash, it snapped forward, jumping clean across the room, and when I went to run toward the door, it jumped right in front of me. Fumbling away, I slipped in a puddle of slime, and it scuttled with such swiftness that I damn near died from fright. In that moment, Something took over me, and I suddenly remembered I had my bug spray. Squeezing the trigger, I cast forth a geyser of pesticidal liquid, drenching the thing in it. Henry cursed with screeching and screaming sounds as he struggled, stumbled, and recalled from me. For a moment, I thought I'd beat him. But after slinking beneath a bed, that abominable child shook the fluid off himself and prepared to attack me once more. Standing up, I raised my spray gun but this time, strings of green gunk spewed out from his eyes and mouth. These pestilent rivers of blighted web netted up my spraying canister, sweeping them far off into the wall beside me. I found myself disarmed and at Henry's mercy as the spidery child crawled out from beneath his bed. Gingerly, he stepped, foot by foot, inch by inch, 
easing himself towards me, like a lion ready to pounce upon some hapless antelope. This time, as he charged forward, mouth chomping with feverish fangs, I jumped aside, and he hit a wall instead of me. Seizing the chance, I ran, faster than ever before. Clearing the few meters between myself and the door, I escaped the room and slammed the wooden barrier shut on his face. Bounding down the stairs, with no concern of their termite-chewed condition, I began calling out for Phil, but he didn't answer. Phil, come on man, we have to go, we have to go now, I cried out with panic sweat running down my head. I told you not to go into his room. An all too familiar, shrewd voice croaked from the corner of the room. Turning my anxious eyes towards the solitary chair in the corner of the living room, I saw Mrs. Kettlewell, shrouded in webs and in cloth, her fingers plated in a yellowish carapace. You're just like the rest of the vermin, always coming in here, trying to move me out or steal my land, upsetting my dear darling Henry, Mrs. Kettlewell sneered, her greenish-grey fangs suddenly on display. Emerging from a hole in the wall beside her came the hideous, eight-legged head of Henry. At least with the others, Henry wouldn't go hungry, but you denied him even that, choosing to hurt my dear Henry, and that won't do, she chirped, her voice wobbling into a criggety tone. Are you going to kill me? I stammered. Deary me, no. You'll live. You have to. You have to tell the rest of the pests out there not to step foot on my property again. That's why I called you. You're going to be my messenger. Of course, don't go telling everyone to stay away. Henry and I still get hungry from time to time. She grinned as she ran her spidery fingers through her son's curly hair. What about Phil? I asked, my feet already edging towards the door. Oh, I'm sorry. I was a little peckish after a long day of shopping. He really was a sweet young man. Mrs. Kettlewell smiled, her lips salivating and wide. Without any further words between us, I sprinted and got the hell out of that place. I'm sorry, Phil. Sorry I left you there, to be another stain on the wall, or a bad smell that just won't go away. But I had to get out of there. I had to tell people if you get the call to go to that house, or if you cross paths with anyone called Mrs. Kettlewell, don't be fooled by a kind old lady act. She is a monster, and to her, we are the vermin. Pearl charged from across the neighbor's lawn, all white fluff and big clumsy paws. My ass collided with the side of my Kia, and I squatted down to accept my daily barrage of puppy kisses. Mrs. Douglas came running after her, dropping her hands to her knees as she reached us. Sorry, she huffed. That damn dog is too fast for her own good. I laughed and scratched Pearl's ears. Have you been a good girl? I asked her. Mrs. Douglas snorted. You're lucky you still have a dog at all. She tried for Pete Hyde Rangers today. Oh no, I said, shifting up and wiping the paw print from my grey slacks. Not too much damage, I hope. Nah, I stopped her in time, thankfully. Thanks, Mrs. D. I flashed her a grin. We owe you our lives. She waved the thought away and turned back toward her own house on the corner. It towered over the small little box I called home, shining a light on my own inadequacies in more ways than one. Oh, she spun back around. That reminds me, he's been asking about your lawn again. Oh, has he? If you just let him mow it, he'll get off your back, and mine. I clicked my tongue and wagged my finger at her. Now, now, Mrs. D, you know I don't give it away that easily. The older woman rolled her eyes, but gave up the fight for now just the same. I corralled Pearl inside and went to work on both our dinners, chuckling to myself about the whole damn thing. I didn't know Mr. Douglas all that well, honestly. Just the things I'd heard from his wife. He was crazy about his yard. I knew that much. More often than not, he was the recipient of the neighborhood's most beautiful lawn award, much to the chagrin of old Mrs. Huxley down the street. He always waved to me as we headed off to work in the morning. But other than that, we didn't talk much. 
he seemed like an average, boring sort of guy. The pointed comments about my own unmanageable mess of weeds and vines might have been taken with greater offence if he wasn't so harmless. I settled down on the couch with a microwave dinner and a PBR just in time to hear Mrs. Douglas calling for the kids out the back door. There were two of them, a boy around ten, Stephen, and his younger sister, Lily. Stephen and his friends were hellions around the neighbourhood, stampeding their bikes up and down streets and driveways, hooping and hollering the whole way. Little Lily followed like a groupie, but from what I could tell, her brother kept a good eye on her. My neighbour's shouts were punctuated by the sound of thundering drumming across the sky, low and distant, but prolonged enough to tell me something massive was coming. Pearl wine next to me. I was in for a long night. Several hours and a handful of beers later, I was laying on my bedroom floor with a pillow and comforter pulled down with me. Pearl was curled tightly in the closet, nose buried in a pause as the rain ripped and rumbled outside. I was just drifting off into a fitful sleep when a resounding crack shook the house and I shot up like a rod. Damn, I thought, here we go. I've been living in fear of the massive oak tree in the backyard since I bought the house in the first place. Its ancient branches hung like a claw over my roof, threatening with every strong wind to reach down and grab a hold of it. I was saving up to get it trimmed, but damn if that wasn't half the cost of my down payment right then and there. I struggled up off the ground, groaning and pouring at the back of my head. Pearl whimpered and ducked away, so I gave her a pat before snatching open the nearby curtain. A torrent of raindrops danced along the window pane, obscuring the view of my backyard. The street lights from the main road provided a meager amount of light that cast shadows over the barely thawed grass and made me squint to make sense of anything. A flash of lightning lit the air, and while the tree in my periphery remained fully intact, that's not what caught my eye. There was someone in my yard. The darkened figure was crouched down in the grass, knees sinking into the watery mud and hands fiddling with something in front of him. I grabbed the jeans still hanging over my dresser and nearly knocked myself back out, hopping around to pull my shoes back over my heels. I should have called the cops, I know that now, but I'd spent plenty of my life living in worse neighbourhoods than this. Honestly, I just thought it was the local crackhead from the apartment complex down the street. I slammed my screen door open and grabbed the aluminium bat I kept propped by the back door. I could handle this just fine on my own, I figured. Hey there, buddy. Time to move it along, I called out to him, one hand shielding my eyes from the downpour. I stuck under the overhang of the roof to keep cover, but as I turned the corner, the automatic light by the door kicked life. The shadow figure turned to face me, and reflexively, I swung the bat up over my head. Mr. Douglas was kneeled in my yard in a pair of fraying boxer briefs, balloon-like gut hanging loose over the elastic band. From his torso down, he was stained slick with something dark and viscous that even the downpour above couldn't wash clean. His eyes were wild in the brightest fluorescent glow, feral almost, like a raccoon caught in a cage. If only. He pulled a foot underneath of himself and pushed slowly off the ground. Mr. Douglas, I said, holding tight to my bat. You are right, man. He weaved forward and to the left, his arm raised up in my direction. More dark liquid oozed out of the appendage, my knees turned to jello. He didn't have any fingers. Well, he still had one. His thumbs, currently hanging off to the side, held on by a small string of sinew. The dangling digit captured his attention and he raised it, trembling to his mouth. I won't lie. I bolted. My screen door crashed behind me, joining the keen of Pearl's deafening howls. She was out of a closet now, trying to push her way out of the door behind me, snarling and spitting. I dropped the bat and grabbed her by the collar instead to wrestle her inside. I clicked the deadbolt in place, just as Mr. Douglas collided full force with the door. My knees sank into my scrunched up comforter on the bedroom floor as I clawed around for my forgotten phone. Pearl's growls, punctuated by bang after bang, left my own fingers shaking like leaves when I finally scooped it up. 
Each ring echoed like a church bell bouncing around inside my ribs. I crawled into the dog's hiding place in the closet, and seconds later, she leapt right in with me. 911, what's the location of your emergency? My neighbour. He's hurt. He's trying to break in. Sir, you need to calm down. What's your location? The sound of glass shattering reverberated from the next room, and I nearly dropped my phone, scrambling back out. 5878 Wallaby Avenue, I shouted out, shoulder and closed my bedroom door, just as a bloody knob snuck through it. What was left of his hand pinched between the door and the frame, just a mass of gristle and bone fragments. I gagged and charged against the door. And what's the nature of the emergency? My neighbour broke in. There's something wrong with him. There's something... It was his turn to throw his body weight against the door. The pressure of the blow left my phone flying from my hand, left me staggering back at its surprising force. The Mr. Douglas I knew was much too much of a lily ass to throw a baseball around with this kid. How the hell did he get so strong? Pearl started up again, darting between us just as another thud left the door flying open and a pale, pudgy body staggered through. His skin was reminiscent of cottage cheese in both texture and tone. The gore caked along his torso and arms didn't do him any favours. Pearl lunged through his groin, and while I winced reflexively at the attack, he didn't so much as whimper. He did, however, reach down for my dog's neck, going for the scruff before he seemed to realise that he couldn't grab a hold. Instead, he levelled a swift kick her way, leaving her squealing. I rushed forward, grabbing the lamp on my dresser, and shoved it as far as I could into his puffy cheeks. The force of the blow left him staggering, but ultimately didn't do much to deter him. He tumbled back over one of the dining room chairs, a shard of glass left in his wake pierced right up through his heel, but even that didn't seem to stop him. He was back up in no time. To my relief, I heard the sweet call of sirens, singing in the distance. I shoved the door closed again and wrapped my arms around Pearl. I hadn't picked her up since she was a pup, and before that moment, I wasn't so sure I could anymore. She struggled against me, but I didn't let up. I held her in a bear hug and stumbled out into the front hall. Behind us, Mr. Douglas fell against the doorframe and braced himself against the wall with his bloody stumps. Time slowed as I pulled at the chain of my front door, red and blue lights flashing in from the front windows. The deadbolt slid and I wrenched the door inwards. Mr. Douglas landed flush against my back as I collapsed into the screen door and spilled out onto my front walkway. It was over in a flash as Pearl squirmed from my grasp and something moist and mushy pushed into my hair. Police already had weapons drawn and aimed. I threw myself forward into the unforgiven cement, rolling to the side and covering my head. A massive fluff climbed on top of me and before I knew it, I was being pulled from the ground by a team of medics. I was near hysterics as they wheeled me into the ambulance. It didn't help when I glanced over to the house on the corner, only to see their windows speckled from the inside, with fresh blood. That was seven months ago now, and nothing has been quite the same since. The street is quieter, neighbours are more closed off. I used the money I've been saving for the tree and built myself a privacy fence instead. I don't want to talk about what he did to his family. Honestly, my therapist has heard enough about the details. Not a night goes by where I don't still see his manic-eyed gaze as I close my eyes to sleep. At least, all of them was accounted for. Mr. Douglas, not so much. You see, they only found four of his fingers. They were sticking up out of thin holes in my yard. Most days, I am able to keep myself from drifting off, staring into their empty house. Most days, I don't even think about those six missing fingers. Between a pandemic and the post-traumatic stress, Pearl's been my lifeline. Neither of us do too well during the storms anymore, but most of the time, her big goofy grin is all that keeps me together. She loves having a yard of her own nowadays. She'd spend all day out there if I let her. Pearl's the one who found it first, poking up out of the ground after the first early spring thaw. A set of bright red leaves shooting up from the dirt. I didn't think much of it when I first caught her digging. Lord knows I didn't plant anything, but it wouldn't be the first time some seeds had blown in and made it their home. 
If they trusted me to provide for them, well, they'd be sorely mistaken. A week later, they were nearly knee-high, and it was all I could do to keep the damn dog's nose out of the dirt. Pearl went wild for them, rolling and flopping and barking up a storm. I shooed her away and tried to keep an eye on it. I made a mental note to try look up the plant later. As they grew, spindly black veins sprouted up through the whole of the leaves. Yesterday, I let her out in the morning and stumbled off towards the kitchen to start my day. I'd barely made it to the coffee pot when Pearl went wild, paws banging against the back door as she whined for my attention. When I peeked out, she squeezed the way back inside, massive red leaves shooting out from either side of her snout. Before I could make sense of it, she was darting around the house, me chasing behind her and grumbling about the impromptu game of keep away. Soon, she cornered herself in the closet. I clicked the bedroom door shut behind me to block her escape. The sliding door squealed as I yanked it open and Pearl knew instantly she'd been caught. She spat the weed to my feet and drove off under the bed. A low, uncharacteristic growl escaped her. With a sigh, I knelt down to collect the mess of dirt and plant matter, only to let them fall again with a startled gasp. At the bottom of the pile, dangling off the roots, was a perfectly preserved human thumb. Pearl took my hesitation as an opening to grab it up again, tucking herself and a wagging tail under the bed as she started to chew. I reached her shaky hand to pull up my curtain. There were three more tufts of red jutting up from the grass. Mr. Douglas planted his fingers in my yard. And now, they're starting to sprout. I woke up later than expected, the sun shining on my face through the only bedroom window not covered by a blind. Had Herbie not cried since... when? I sat up slowly and picked up the baby monitor. It was on, and I could see the black and white image of his crib, his small form still beneath the blue blanket my mother had given him. I began to feel uneasy as I thought back to the night before. I remembered putting him down at eleven and then checking on him at midnight before heading to bed, but usually he would wake me up between three and four and again between six and eight. I looked at my phone. It was 10.15. Had he really slept through the night for once? Or had I slept through him crying? Or was something wrong? Pulling back the sheets, I jumped up, my heart pounding in time with my steps as I ran down the hall to his room. The house was so silent, and when I went into the nursery, the instinct that something was wrong just grew stronger. The room felt empty and cold. I looked over into the crib, I was reaching out to pull back the blanket when I stopped myself. I could already see the rise and fall of his chest and his face was unblemished by discomfort or bad dreams. He was sleeping well and peacefully and here I was about to wake him up instead of being grateful for a few hours apiece. I was about to ease back out and go make some coffee when I heard a funny little snoring sound. Herbie had never snored before though I guess there was a first time for everything especially with a three-month-old baby. Still, I felt a new twist of worry. What if he was getting sick, and that wasn't a snore? It was a wheeze. Wincing at the idea of disturbing him, I gently pulled back the blanket and picked him up. He didn't stir, his expression not changing from the placid mask of someone lost in deep slumber. This worried me more, as he normally woke up as soon as I touched him, but I held my fear in check as I eased him to my shoulder and put my ear to his face. It didn't sound like a wheeze, but it wasn't a snore either, exactly. It was a thinner, more rhythmic sound that grew quiet and then louder, but was always there. Still thinking about congestion, I lifted Herbie up a bit and put my ear to his chest. The sound was clearly here, a whirring thrum that seemed to vibrate from somewhere in his core. That wasn't right at all. I needed to call the doctor and carry. That's when I felt the hard place on his back. My fingers had just brushed it, but the wrongness of it was immediately obvious. Under his onesie, right in the middle of his back, 
was a long, flat hardness that was cool to the touch. What was that? Laying him back down on his stomach, I pulled the onesie down as my breath caught in my throat. It was a coin slot. A metal coin slot, like one you might find on an old-fashioned machine at one of those antique arcades or fairs. I reached out and touched the edges of it, thinking somehow it had gotten stuck to him. But no. It was flush against the flesh of my baby's back. Hard brass grown seamlessly into soft, pink skin. My mind was reeling, torn between confusion and fear and the growing realization that Herbie still hadn't woken up. That's when I noticed the small grey envelope jutting out from the triangle of the blanket nearby. Plucking it out, I felt the weight of something small and hard inside, and when I opened it, a thin silver coin tumbled out into my palm. Still in shock, I turned it over in my hand, studying it. One side was embossed with the face of a smiling woman crowned with a corona of sunlight. The other side showed the same woman, her thin face hard and sinister as she glared up at the moon. My eyes went back to Herbie, and then to the envelope, where I could see a thin line of cramped writing on the inside of the upper flap. This is better. It's coin operated. I started to shudder, the envelope fluttering from my hand as I picked Herbie up again and began to rub his face and his arms, his legs and his feet, desperately crooning for him to wake up, to get up now. It was time to wake up and quit playing this joke. He just lay limply in my arms, purring that strange, rusty sounding snore without stirring at all. I put him back down, tears blurring my vision as I tried to decide what to do. I should call 911. He must be sick or I was crazy, and either way, we needed help. But what if this was real? And what if the coin fixed things somehow? I hadn't remembered dropping the coin, but after a moment of panic, I found it on top of the blanket, gleaming dully as I held it in my hand. This was all insane, like some kind of nightmare, but maybe if I played the rules, I'd wake up and everything would be okay. So I turned Herbie back over and took down his onesie again. The coin slot was still there, cool to the touch and solidly real. Holding my breath, I put the coin up to the opening and dropped it in. There was a muffled clink, and then the whirring snore grew louder for a moment before turning into a yawning sigh. Herbie turned his head and tried to push himself over as he began to wake. I let out a gasp and picked him up, looking into his face and finding his eyes. He was looking back at me, his expression drowsy but interested as he gave me what might have been a slight smile. He was okay and I was just messed up or... But no, the coin slot was still back there, and I could still hear the low frequency whirring coming from inside him somewhere. Not the wet beating of a heart, but the dry orbits of some intricate clockwork. My skin went cold as I eased the thing back down into the crib. It tried to hold on to me, but I gently pushed his grasping hands away. I didn't know what this thing was, but it was my baby. Turning, I started out of the room. I get my phone and call mom, and then I go looking for Herbie. Maybe he was still in the house, but I had a feeling he was gone. Someone had taken him and left that envelope, left that thing in... Daddy? I froze, turning slowly as Herbie's face peered at me over the edges of the crib. How was that possible? It would have had to jump several inches and pulled itself up onto the ledge and Herbie was a long time from being able to form any words. Daddy. The tone was harder now, almost accusing, and my baby's face was drawing down into a pouting frown. I felt anger mixing with my fear as I took a step forward. I'm... I'm not your daddy. Whatever you are, you aren't mine. The thing froze for a moment, and I had the thought that maybe it had broken or wound down but its cheek jumped as it began to pull itself over the edge. I am. I'm your baby. Grunting, it tugged its belly over the railing and flopped down onto the ground. Despite myself, 
I felt a moment of horrified panic that it had hurt itself. A moment later, the panic turned to terror as its limbs rotated with a whir and it flipped itself over and began to crab walk towards me. Come, hold me. I was backpedaling now, trying to close the door before it reached me, but it was too fast, leaping forward through the closing crack and landing on my chest. It squealed in my face with a sound like grinding gears as sparks glowed from somewhere down in its throat. Screaming, I grabbed it and slammed it against the wall and then the floor before kicking it away from me. The meat of it was ruined now, the fleshy covering ripped and torn in a dozen places to reveal bits of gleaming metal and coiled wire, gears and axles flailing disconsolately as their places in the orderly hole were disrupted and destroyed. It was dying now, but even still it called to me, crawling to me as it clicked together pink gums made of thin strips of beaten tin. Da. D. I'm your babe now. I was terrified to approach it, but my revulsion and rage was growing again, and I needed to make sure it was dead and stay that way. Darting forward, I stomped on it, once, twice, and then a final third time, and that's when the silver coin popped free from the mechanical ruin, rolling down the hole a few feet before sprawling and falling down, the evil face of the Moonlight Queen glaring up into the sky, or perhaps toward me. I was half crazy as I searched the nursery and then the house for Herbie. When I saw no sign of him, I called Mom, screaming and crying into the phone before hanging up. I had upset her, but it couldn't be helped. She sounded as confused as I was, but I felt sure she'd call the police like I asked. I had other things to do. I had the thought that I could go back and look at the recorded footage from the baby monitor, see what had happened to Herbie and when. My hands were shaking as I picked it up from beside the bed and tapped on the screen. It always kept the last 24 hours, so I jumped back 10 hours and then started fast forwarding through the footage. I found what I was looking for at 3.15. A pair of small figures appeared from the shadows in the far corner of the room. There was no door or window there, so I wasn't sure where they'd really come from, but I was more concerned with what they were doing. Helping each other up, they pulled themselves over into the crib. One of them scooped up Herbie as the other was opening a dark sack and pulling his replacement out onto the bed. Weeping, I watched as Herbie began to wake and struggle, a tiny, furred hand covering his mouth before he could let out a frightened wail. The other had placed the blanket over the fake and was now opening up the sack again, even as the one holding my baby stuffed Herbie inside. In a moment, they were back over the side of the crib and gone into the dark. I dropped the monitor onto the bed and ran back into the nursery to check it. Maybe there was a hole in the wall or a secret door, something I could use to follow wherever they had taken my baby. I just needed to check every inch of the... nursery. Except, it wasn't a nursery anymore. The room was bare. No crib, no toys or changing table, no stacks of books or rocking chair. Even the walls were the stark grey they'd been when I first moved in two years ago. How was any of this happening? Stumbling back into the hall, I saw that the ruined baby thing was gone too. There was no sign of its broken bits or torn disguise. There was no sign of anything. Not even... The coin. My heart leapt as I saw it, still dully gleaming from its resting place on the carpet. The woman's face still harsh and displeased in the silver moonlight of some distant night. But that didn't matter. What mattered was that it was proof. Proof of what had happened. Proof that someone had taken my Herbie. I let out a small scream as the doorbell rang. The police. They were here and I could show them the coin and the video and they'd help me get my baby back. When I opened the door, I saw it was Mom instead. Her face drawn and pale as she looked at me. I... Are you alright? I stared at her, incredulous. Of course not. They took him. They took him. And we have to get him back. Did you call the cops? Her face drew down further into a frown. No, no, I didn't. You weren't making any sense. You were talking about... A baby? What baby? 
Stepping back, I felt a chill run up my spine. My baby, Herbie, they took him. She followed me inside, shaking her head slightly. Baby? I don't know what you're talking about. You don't have a baby. You never have. I could barely breathe. That... that's not true. I have a baby, little Herbie. What's wrong with you? I started to cry again. They... they took him and tried to trick me or trade with me. They gave me a little mechanical baby that looked like him, but it wasn't him, and then it attacked me, and then I saw them take him, and the room was a nursery, but now it's not. And I need you to know this. I need you to remember and help me find him. My mother stepped forward and swept me up in a hug, stroking my hair as I wept against her shoulder. There, there. I think you're sick, honey. We need to get you some help. It'll be okay. I wrapped my arms around her neck, but now I started to recoil. How could she not remember him? I was still pulling away when my fingertips brushed something against the back of her neck. It was a coin slot. I froze, staring at her as she smiled at me, her eyes jumping slightly to the left and right as she watched me, holding me tighter with the soft, ratcheting ticks of some internal metronome. This is better. Just accept it. She was too strong for me to push away, so I took into my pocket instead, found the coin that rested there, caressing the queen's cheek as I pulled it free and reached around its neck to the coin slot embedded into whatever it called a spine. I saw its eyes widened as I dropped the coin in. And then, it began to scream. I stood in front of my grandpa's cabin, the keys to the front door in hand and the engine of my truck rumbling gently behind me. The sun raced towards the ground, throwing its final rays of light over the forest. I came here to escape the madness of everyday life, to unwind and let my mind cool off for a month. Working as a game dev during the pandemic did a number on my mental health and I needed to recharge my batteries before plunging back in. Too many impossible deadlines, too much crunch to finish a terrible product, too much isolation. They eroded my sanity until I couldn't take it anymore. I reached the front door and tried the keys one by one. Turned out it was the last I tried, because of course it would be that one. The door swung aside with creaks of its rusty hinges, opening up the cabin's insights to the world for the first time in over two years. I stepped in, slow and careful, shining the light of my phone around to see. A thick layer of dust covered everything, denoting the property's descent into disuse since my grandpa's passing. None of his sons or grandkids cared enough to come and check on it, so it fell into disrepair. No one had even wanted it when the will was read out, so it was passed around until it ended up with me. And truth be told, I didn't care much for it either. We were all city dwellers living in New York, so no one was keen to inherit a dingy cabin out in the wilderness of Ohio. Still, with the arrival of this blasted pandemic, I was happy to have signed those papers. I spent a few minutes familiarizing myself with the cabin again. It had been more than a decade since the last time I came out here with my grandpa. He had expanded the structure since then, adding a guest room and an actual kitchen. First things first, I went up into the attic to turn on the generator. Since it hadn't been used in so long, it needed a bit of maintenance before it started up. I replaced the coolant and oil, installed new filters, and I even replaced the spark plugs. The batteries and belt drives looked fine, so I let them be. Last thing to do was refuel it, and voila, I had electricity. With the lights in the cabin coming on, I checked the fridge and the pantry cleaning them of all cans before restocking them with my own. I finished ferrying my supplies inside from the truck, I ate a can of something for dinner, and I went to bed for the night. The next day, I had my work cut out for me cleaning the cabin. When I was done with the inside, I went around it to the shed out in the back. I found the place cluttered with various tools and knickknacks, but the centerpiece was what immediately got my attention. Rusting away in the middle of the shed 
surrounded by worthless junk on all sides, was my grandpa's old four-wheeler. A bulky two-seater ATV with a cage around it that made it look like a dune buggy. I felt like a kid on Christmas morning, eager to get my hands on my present. Figuring the keys had to be somewhere in the shed, I left more cows behind me in my search of them. But I found them in a nearby drawer, and I gave the four-wheeler's engine a tentative test. It didn't turn on, of course, but I expected that. Much like I did with the generator, I ran some maintenance on it, though it took me much longer to get it running. Luckily, it wasn't anything major. The battery was drained. With my new vehicle, my vacation got a thousand times better. Even though I had my truck with me, it was ill-fitted to brave the unsteady terrain of the forest. I spent that day and the next cleaning out the shed as well, throwing away the junk and doing an inventory of what I wanted to keep. And let me tell you, that shed was the gift that kept on giving. Besides a ton of useful tools, I found a couple of fishing poles with sets of lures and floats, all in very good condition, as well as an old-timey compound bow with ten arrows. As soon as I was done with cleaning, I hopped on the four-wheeler and made my way to the nearby lake to catch some fish and end my vegetarian streak. Calling it a lake is, well, a bit generous on my part. It's more of a pond than anything else, an area where the river overflows into a meadow at the edge of my property. The shores are muddy and infested with reeds, the water is shallow throughout, but there's fish to be caught. I found a nice patch of grass under a tree, so I cast out the line and waited. It took a while to get a bite, and I almost missed it. I jumped on the fishing rod and started reeling the fish in. When it was finally out of the water and into my hands, I admired my catch before throwing it into a bucket I brought along. I applied new bait to the hook and cast the line again, but as I went to lie down, something caught my eye. On the other side of the pond, hidden in the thick shadows of the forest, I saw a deer. It stared directly at me, unmoving, and I could feel its eyes scale me up. As soon as I moved though, it bolted away, so I didn't think much of it. I was in the middle of the wilderness. Seeing animals was a given. I ended up catching a few fish about the size of my palm. After I discarded them and threw them on the grill, along with some veggies, they made for a tasty meal. Having finally eaten some meat, my mood improved exponentially. I decided to try out the bow, doing a quick and dirty job of painting a target on a nearby tree. I, of course, missed all of the arrows that I launched at it, but it was a lot of fun. The next few days were spent in a similar manner, and I slowly fell into a routine. Go fishing in the morning, batch up the cabin after lunch, and either drive the four-wheeler around or practice my aim with a bow in the evenings. It took me a while, but at the end of the second day, I was hitting the tree more often than not, and by the end of the third, I started landing arrows inside of the target. The cabin itself didn't need as much work as I thought it would. My grandpa built it out of treated logs, so it was pretty sturdy and it didn't show signs of rot. The roof was ceramic shingles, so besides checking if they shifted about, I didn't need to do much else. By the time my first proper weekend there rolled around, I decided to give hunting small prey a try. Fish are nice and all, but they can't compare to proper meat. I got out Saturday morning, I hunted with my bow and some bait in the form of chopped veggies and trekked on foot to the edge of the property. Seeing as I rode around on a four-wheeler a lot, most animals got scared away around the cabin. I found some bushes at the edge of a clearing, and if my math wasn't failing me, I was still well within my property. I threw the bait around and hungered down, waiting for some small critter or another to come take a bite. The only thing I forgot to account for was how boring the wait turned out to be. Laid on my belly in the bushes, I nearly fell asleep a couple of times. I don't know how long I waited until I got my first signs of prey, but I heard something approach me. The bow came up in my hands and I notched an arrow, ready to pull it back and let it fly at a moment's notice. But when I caught sight of the animal, I relaxed. The silhouette of a deer scampered around in the forest in front of me, 
taking tentative steps in my direction, but I wasn't equipped to take it down. If it got too close and would eat my bait, I'd simply scare it away and wait for something else. But it never did. Instead, stopping at the edge of the clearing and looking straight at me. I knew I was too well hidden to be seen so easily, but then again, animals have better eyesight and smell than me. It watched me for a few minutes, and, in turn, I admired its majesty. I'd never seen a live deer so close up to that point, but even so, I was sure that this particular one was much more beautiful than the average buck. Then, as soon as it came, the buck turned and ran away. I was a bit bummed out, but I didn't dwell on it for long. Only minutes later, my prey of choice appeared as well. A plump rabbit came out of the underbrush, hopping around the clearing until it found a piece of carrot. It grabbed the bait with its front paws, rising up on its hind legs to keep on the lookout while it munched away. Sadly for it, the position it chose left it facing away from me. I drew the arrow back, held my breath to steady my aim, and let it fly at the unsuspecting animal. But I missed, and the arrow ended up glancing the rabbit's ear. It let out a shriek and bolted, squirting blood everywhere in its frantic run for safety. I jolted up from the ground to follow it, feeling that annoying sensation of static spreading my legs. The rabbit was small and fast, but I kept up with it, even if just barely. We ran through the forest in more or less a straight line, swerving between trees and dodging prickly underbrush. I was sure that I'd leave my property at this rate, so I got another arrow out of the quiver and I slowed down as I notched it. With only a fraction of a second left to aim, I let the arrow fly. The rabbit almost dodged it, but it changed direction at the last moment and the arrow hit it in the nape. It fell over, dead, keeping up the running motion as his body was ravaged by spasms. I took a deep sigh of relief, putting the bow away before I walked over to the rabbit to pick it up. As I reached it and leaned down, a voice resounding through the forest stopped me. You're trespassing on my private property, the voice yelled. No sort of moves or I'll shoot. I got up slowly, raising my hands up in the air as I looked around. The forest distorted the sound, making it echo off the trees, so I couldn't pinpoint its exact location. But I could tell that it was a man, mid-fifties to early sixties by his tone and demeanour. I didn't mean to, I answered, feeling my pulse rising. It was an accident. I chased a rabbit and left my own property. Your property? The man asked, stepping out in the open. He was some fifty feet away, dressed in camo clothes and shouldering a mean-looking rifle. Are you one of Barry's sons? He asked. One of his grandsons, I answered, recognizing my grandpa's name. My name's Isaac. You should have said so sooner, Sonny, the man said, putting the rifle away and walking towards me. Nearly shot you there. Barry would have killed me for that. He laughed at that, setting me at ease. I put my hands down and waited for him to reach me, observing him better as he approached. Turns out, I was not only right in my earlier assessment, but I was generous with a few years. He looked like he was in his mid-sixties, with a tall frame, wide shoulders, and a gaunt face drowned out by white stubble. He was missing his left ear, part of his lower lip, and the tip of his nose and his left cheek ran rampant with scars. His appearance was scary, I won't lie, especially given the circumstances of our meeting, but his beaming smile helped. I doubt that Grandpa can do that anymore, I said. So, you kicked the bucket, huh? The man asked. I nodded my head in answer. I figured that was the case when he stopped coming out here. We were hunting buddies. Name's Huck, he said, extending me his hand for a shake. All of Barry's family is welcome on my land. Sorry again. No problem, I said, trying to sound reassuring. It's not like you could have known. Huck looked down at the rabbit, then back up at me. His brows furrowed, and his amusement died down as suddenly as it had appeared. Did you kill anything else out here? He asked with a deep sense of worry and urgency. Have you been here for long? A week, I answered, and I caught some fish but nothing else other than that. Huck's tense posture deflated when he heard that, and his shoulders slouched as he took a deep inhale. 
His reaction had me curious, but I didn't go prime about it. Good, he said. The fish are free. Yansa doesn't mind those. Yansa? I asked. Who's that? Some ranger? I thought I could hunt without a permit on private land here. Yansa is... Hug started, but his words stopped in his throat. He took a hand to his nape, rubbing it over his grey hair in long streaks. Yansa is the forest. The spirit of it. That's the best way I can put it, but it ain't quite right. I couldn't help but show my utter lack of belief at the mention of Mumbo Jumbo, and Hug noticed. He got defensive, and his attitude shifted from worry to annoyance. I know it sounds crazy, he said, taking a finger to his face and dragging it over one of the longest scars he had, one that ran from the remnants of his left ear all the way down his jaw, stopping just shy of his neck. But I have the scars to prove it. Going against Yanza's wishes is a terrible idea. Fine, I said, relenting all of the sarcasm that I had in store. The fish are free. What else? I'm guessing the rabbit isn't. The fish are free. Everything else is a gift that Yansa wants you to have. Huck explained. You set out this morning to hunt a rabbit. Yansa brought you a rabbit. Simple as. Know what you want to hunt. Come prepared with the right tools and Yansa will provide. But only kill what Yansa allows you to. Nothing else. Okay, I half said, half asked. Anything else? Don't cause suffering. Be swift with your kill. All of the animals are Yansa's children, and it doesn't appreciate that. Once you start a hunt, you have to end it. Yansa doesn't like its gifts being wasted. Same with using the carcass. Make the most of it. And only the animal's flesh is yours. You have to return the spirit to Yansa. This all sounded like a bunch of new age hippie BS, but I could at least appreciate the underlying message. Be kind, be thankful. Everything in nature is part of a big unity. All of that soul warming stuff. Even though I didn't buy it, I could at least sympathize with Hug's intentions, so I humored him. And how can I do that? I asked. Cut out the animal's heart where it fell, and burying it while saying a short prayer. The words don't matter. Yansa appreciates the intent more than the prayer itself. Fine, let's give it a try, I said, wishing to just get it over with already. Do you happen to have a knife? I didn't pack one. Huck pulled out a hunting knife from a sheath in his clothes, handing it to me and kneeling alongside me. I did a small incision, pulled out the rabbit's heart, and buried it while mumbling a thank you for your sacrifice. Huck seemed pleased by it, so I slung the rabbit over my shoulder and got up to walk back to my cabin. Wanna come over for a beer at my place? He asked before I got to take a single step. It's not too far away, and I want to ask you more about Barry, if you don't mind. I really miss my hunting buddy. I paused for a moment, thinking it over. Huck had a few quirks and strange beliefs, but then again, who doesn't? He didn't seem like a bad person or unstable by any means, so I stood to lose nothing, but I could gain a friend and a cold beer. Sure thing, lead the way, I answered. So Huck did just that taking off through the forest with me on his heels. We walked through the underbrush, under the sun's intense midsummer heat, with him bombarding me with questions about my grandpa. By the looks of it, Huck wasn't lying. He knew grandpa, and he knew him well, but it was clear that they hadn't seen each other in quite some time, even before grandpa's passing. Anyway, true to his word, Huck's cabin was only 15 minutes away. It was a bit smaller than grandpa's, but it looked just as homely. We took to its shade when we reached it, and Huck showed me to a porch swing before going inside to get the promised beer. I peered in through the open door, seeing that the cabin was full of pelts, trophies, and various trinkets made from animal parts. It gave off a very arts and crafts air, certainly not what I expected from the impression that Huck gave me. I took the seat he offered me before he returned, and he found me swinging back and forth, feet in the air like a little kid. Huck brought out a cooler filled with ice and bottles, and he retrieved two beers from it before he joined me. Slow down, he urged. I'll throw up. I did as he asked, taking the beer from him and opening it. Cheers, 
he said, raising his up in the air for a toast. For new neighbours, I said with a chuckle. We spent a while talking about this or that, mostly small stuff. Huck asked me about myself and what I did for a living, trying to get to know me better. When I told him that I was a programmer making video games, he was very impressed, and his reaction made me laugh a little. Takes a lot of brains for a job like that, he said defensively. More than I got. We talked some more as we finished beer after beer, and the subject of my grandpa soon returned. I told Hook what happened, that he died peacefully in his sleep from a heart attack, and then I started asking questions of my own. So, you and Grandpa haven't met in a long time, right? I asked. Barry, you stopped joining me for hunts a while back, Huck answered. Stop visiting me too. We had a falling out, but I never stopped considering him a friend. Why? What happened? I asked. I never spent as much time with my Grandpa as I could have. We mostly saw each other during holidays and family gatherings, so... He didn't get to tell me about many things going on in his life. Huck is one of those things. I never even knew that the man existed. Now, he offered me a window back in time, a perspective of Grandpa that no one else had, and I decided to take advantage of that. We went hunting, Huck said, his tone quieter than before. We were hoping for a boar, to get some decent meat, you know. I nodded my head, so he continued. Well, we found a buck instead, a damn gorgeous one with the most beautiful antlers I've ever seen. And Barry, he knew about the answer too. He knew that we weren't supposed to hunt it. We came out for boars, not deer, but he said that he had to have that buck. We argued over it, and when it became clear that Barry wouldn't back down, I... I shot the buck myself. He made a motion of bringing up a gun and aiming it putting on a pain expression when he pulled the imaginary trigger. Buckshot, Huck said in a grave voice. But I was too far away. I clipped the buck's face, but it didn't bring it down. Blew off its left ear, lower lip, and mangled the left side of its snout. He took a hand to his own face, tracing his fingers along the scars that he wore, and I realized the implications. It ran away, and we couldn't find it again and Yansa made sure to pay me back for doing what I did. I winced hearing Huck's story, but I didn't interrupt him with questions. I was fine with whatever details he wanted to share. I didn't want to ask him for more when I saw the pain that the memories brought him. Me and Barry, we... we argued, threw names and accusations around, and the words hurt, you know. Barry left in a fit and told me he didn't want to see me ever again, and he stuck to his word. I'm sorry, I said. Yeah, me too, Hug said. I'm glad that I pulled the trigger first, and the answer came for me. I'm glad that I took that pain for my friend. I'm just... I don't know. I wish Barry had found out and appreciated it, you know. I wish we were still friends. The conversation slowed down after that, and it was abundantly clear that I caused it with my questions. I finished the third beer and wanted to get up, but Hug stopped me. Let me take care of that for you, he said, pointing at the rabbit. The meat might go bad before you get home. Yansa won't appreciate that. I didn't want to accept, but then I thought it over. I didn't know the first thing about skinning and gutting an animal, so this was the perfect opportunity for me to learn. Hug went inside and returned with a chopping board as well as an assortment of tools for the job. His hands were nimble as he worked, and his skills were a dead giveaway of his experience. Before I got to finish another beer, he skinned, gutted and portioned the rabbit expertly. He sealed the meat in bags, which he handed over to me, and he went a little ways away from the cabin to throw away the guts and whatever else couldn't be used. They'll make fine dining for some critter or another, he said when he returned. It's as good a way as any to return them to Yansa. I flinched at hearing their name mentioned once again. It started getting on my nerves, but I bit my tongue and kept my sarcastic replies to myself. Huck also wanted to give me the rabbit's pelt, but I told him to keep it as a gift, since I didn't know how to treat it anyway. Here, he offered when I took off on foot. I'll take you home. It's getting late, and the forest 
isn't safe at night. No, it's fine. I try to refuse, but Hook really isn't the type to take no for an answer. Nonsense, he said, and rushed behind his cabin. In a few moments, the sound of an engine coming to life rumbled through the clearing. Hook returned on a four-wheeler, much like my own, with only a different paint job to tell it apart. I hopped on, and he drove me to my cabin, going slowly and cautiously. We were both intoxicated and in no condition to drive, and he seemed aware of that. Take care, Sonny, he said when we reached my cabin and I got off. If you ever need anything, you know where to find me. Will do, I assured him and went inside. I went to bed for the night, and I soon fell asleep, helped by the alcohol in my blood. The next day, I cooked the stew I so desperately craved and heard a knock on the door as I dashed around the stove. Huck came to visit, with him another six-pack of beer and a warm hug after I opened the door for him. Sit down, I said, pointing at the table. Food's almost ready. Thanks, Sonny, he said, pulling out a chair and throwing himself in it. I fetched another bowl and a set of cutlery for him. We cracked open the beers and talked some more as we waited for the stew. I come out here every weekend, Hug said. I live nearby, so I'll be gone Sunday evening, but I'll be back next Friday. Take care while I'm away, okay? I will, I said, sensing worry in his voice. I'll follow the rules, don't worry. Hug said with a soft smile that pulled his scarred lips upwards. You should check on that stew, by the way. I did, as I was told, and found that the stew was ready to be served. We ate a bowl each, and I even went back for seconds. It turned out delicious. I never expected wild meat to be such a big step up from the store-bought. After a few more beers, Hook got up and left, saying that he wanted to get in one more hunt for the weekend. He wanted me to join him, but seeing as I only had a bow and he wanted to bag something bigger than a rabbit, I turned him down. Bring the right tool for the job or something, right? I said. Yup, Hook answered with a smile and patted my shoulder. You'll do just fine, I'm sure of it. With that, Hook left to do his own thing. I spent the day lazing about, catching up on some reading and being all around unproductive, but with the cabin sorted out and enough meat to my freezer to last me for a few days, I didn't have anything to do. I won't bore you with what I did after that, since it was pretty much more of the same thing. Hook left Sunday evening, just like he said he would, leaving me all alone. But I appreciated the solitude, and I had a blast doing whatever I wanted on the property. Despite my promise, I didn't follow Hook's seemingly crazy warnings. I saw no point in most of them to be honest. I also didn't do much hunting anyway, opting for fishing most days for an easier source of meat. And on the few occasions that I did hunt again, I went for small prey that I could either trap or kill with a bow. So, mostly squirrels and rabbits. Huck did return the next weekend, and he came to visit first thing Sunday morning. He brought me some more beer, which I was thankful for, since I didn't bring any. I've seen sons of hogs on the far side of my property, he said, and I brought an extra rifle for you if you want to join me. I'll split the catch with you, of course. Sure, why not, I said, and just like that, I signed myself up. We went out, and this time I was better prepared. I brought my own hunting knife and took my bow with me, despite the rifle Huck had given me. We ended up finding the hogs, a feat which Huck attributed to Yanser once again. We shot a couple of them dead before the rest scrambled, and he did his ritual. I stood a little ways away, on guard in case any of the other hogs returned to attack us. I had a sound far away from me, so I turned as I raised and aimed the rifle. But when I looked through the scope, all I saw was a deer. My tense body unwound and I aimed the rifle down as I took my finger off the trigger. Huck heard the commotion I made, so he shot up to his feet and noticed the deer as well. The rise met for a few moments and Huck nodded his head at it. The deer took off into the forest and he got back down on his hunches to finish bearing the hearts. So many deer in these parts, I said when he was done. What? Huck asked, taken aback. I've seen a lot of them around. They don't seem scared of me. 
That's like the fifth or sixth one. Hearing that, Huck frowned. He rubbed his bloody hands on his jeans to clean them and approached me. Did you hunt while I was gone? He asked, and I could tell that he wasn't messing around. Yeah, I answered honestly. Some squirrels and rabbits. And did you return their spirits the answer like I taught you? I did. I lied to his face, but it was enough to set him at ease. Good, he said. It's probably just curious about you. You're a new arrival after all. Without another word, Huck left to retrieve the four-wheeler. The hogs were too heavy for us to carry by ourselves. I stayed behind to guard them from foragers, and Huck was hasty with his return. We tied them to the vehicle and went back, with Huck promising to bring me my share of the meat when he was done butchering it. Take the rifle back too, I said before we parted at the halfway point. Keep it. Maybe you'll need it, Huck said, and his gesture of kindness surprised me. Nah, I said. I don't want to risk breaking it or something. Huck gave in and took the rifle from my hands. See you tomorrow, neighbor. See ya. It was nearing sundown by the time I got back on my property, so I picked up the pace to make it home in time. There wasn't anything dangerous out in the forest as far as I knew. No wolves or bears or anything, but I didn't feel safe in the darkness of the night. I was maybe 20 minutes away when the sun touched the horizon draping the world in shadows of bloody red. My senses sharpened as my alertness reached this peak, and I looked every which way as I walked. I usually wasn't so paranoid, but I guess that Hug's constant yapping about this Yanza spirit really got to me. Anyway, I found one of the paths that cut through the forest and led back to the cabin, so I followed it. I was only about a mile away, so I still had a little ways to go but something stopped me dead in my tracks. Another damn deer veered in from the forest behind me, halting in the middle of the path and freezing like a statue when it noticed me. It gave me a good scare for a moment, but my fear soon turned to admiration. This particular specimen was a buck, and the most damn beautiful one I'd ever laid eyes on. Its fur all but glistened in the sun's fading rays. Its big round eyes pierced my soul, and his antlers were tall spires of an unmatched elegance. I made no sudden moves, but the buck wasn't scared of me anyway. The moment I saw it, I was so taken aback by its beauty that I just knew I had to have it, cliché as that might sound. I could already imagine the trophy, a centerpiece that would take up any room. The only problem was how to kill the buck, since I only had my bow with me. Screw it, I decided. I can take the shot. I slowly pulled the bow up and over my head, and I retrieved an arrow from the quiver. The buck didn't try to run, so I notched the arrow and took aim, hoping to hit it square in the neck. A deep sense of anxiety invaded me as I pulled the arrow back, as if what I was about to do was absolute sacrilege, but I didn't falter. I let the arrow fly. The buck tried to turn and run away at the last moment, but it was too late. The arrow clipped it in the lower jaw, and I saw it spit out part of its tongue, mixed with blood and broken teeth. Regret instantly flooded me, and I took off after it, pulling out my hunting knife to hopefully give it a quick end, but the buck took off. Realizing that I couldn't catch up to it, I tried to pull out another arrow, but I wasn't fast enough. In a matter of moments, it got away, and the prospect of the night creeping up on me kept me from following it. I couldn't track it through the dark, and I'd end up lost in the forest. So I put the bow away and kept walking back to the cabin, feeling terrible the whole way. Not for what I tried, but for failing. By the time I reached it, night had already settled, so I hurried inside and turned on all the lights. I was still spooked, but I figured it was just hug stories rubbing me the wrong way. Nothing that a tasty dinner and some sleep couldn't fix. Or so I hoped. I had a bit of trouble falling asleep that night, but I managed to after a while. I don't know how late it was when I was awoken by a loud bang coming from the other side of the cabin. All I knew was that it was the middle of the night and it was dark as balls outside. Another bang came, louder than the one before it as it echoed through the cabin, so I jumped to my feet. 
I didn't get to dress up, as the banging continued and was soon accompanied by scraping sounds as well. I retrieved the bow and the hunting knife, which, yeah, it offered me little in the means of protection if I faced some predator, but it was better than snooping around empty-handed. The banging kept coming, and I pinpointed it to the guest room. I opened the door slowly to check out the situation outside through the window, but I didn't need to approach it. The sight I was met with left me paralyzed in fear. Outside, crashing headfirst into the cabin's sturdy walls repeatedly, was a deer. One much bigger than it had any right to be, with crooked antlers bent and broken at awkward angles. Seeing me, it charged at the window, sending shards of glass flying into the room and breaking me free from my stupor. I yelled, but that only angered the deer. It pushed its head into the room, breaking the window's frame and cutting itself as it tried to reach me. I didn't stick around. I turned and bolted down the corridor in a terror-fueled sprint. I didn't know where to, but it didn't matter so long as I got away from it. I tried to reach the front door, but the deer figured me out. By the time I got there, it was already headbutting it, and even if I reached it, what then? I couldn't outrun it on foot. I needed wheels, and I needed to find help. So, I changed direction and ran to the bedroom, fishing the four-wheeler's keys out of my pants. It was just beyond the cabin, so I opened the window and jumped out. The deer quickly followed me around the cabin, finding me the moment my feet hit the grassy ground outside. In the moon's washed-out light, I got a better look at it. My initial assessment was horribly wrong. It was so much bigger than I thought. Bigger than a damn moose, and much more imposing. But the thing that froze the blood in my veins, its fur was disheveled revealing rotting flesh and exposed bone beneath. Its eyes were shiny and clouded by white swirls, and I felt its gaze push me into overdrive when it landed on me. It charged at me, and I dodged its slam in the nick of time. I heard it collide with the cabin, sending the whole structure rocking back and forth, but I didn't stop to look back. I bolted towards the four-wheeler and jumped on it, my hands trembling like an earthquake as I tried to get the keys into ignition. The engine roared to life beneath me, so I floored it through the clearing. The deer came at me from the side, but I hit the brakes hard and watched it fly in front of me. Before it regained its bearings, I took off towards the trees, hoping it would have trouble following me. It did to some degree, but I couldn't outright lose it. I saw its shadow in the forest as I navigated the bumpy terrain, and whenever I reached the more clear part of the woods, it tried to charge me again, but I kept constant track of it so it didn't manage to get me. My destination was Hook's cabin, the closest human and the only one with proper guns. The drive up to his clearing was utter madness. I don't think I let up the acceleration for even a second. In retrospect, I'm surprised I didn't crash into a tree or a ditch or something, but in that moment, I didn't think straight. I was pumped so full of adrenaline and terror that I disregarded all consequences. My only goal was to escape the demonic deer following me. Huck! I started yelling the moment I burst into his clearing. Huck, help! Turning my head around, I saw that the deer paused by the forest edge, breaking the pursuit. Huck shot out of his cabin, dressed in only boxes and shouldering one of his rifles. I stopped in front of his porch and jumped off the four-wheeler, running up to him as I panted heavily. What's up, Sonny? He asked, not tearing his gaze from the forest. It's a damn demon deer! I yelled in answer. It's trying to kill me. What the hell did you do? Hug scolded. As if on cue, the deer left the cover of the trees, making itself known. That's the answer. What in the ever-loving hell did you do, you stupid kid? I couldn't answer. Couldn't even move when I laid eyes on it again. The answer had grown bigger than before, towering over us, about the size of Hug's cabin at this point. I'm sorry, I blurted. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I heard the rifle clatter as it hit the ground, and looked up to find that Hook dropped it from his hands. He kneeled in front of me and grabbed my shoulders, and I could see pure terror in his eyes. They'd grown watery as tears escaped him, but even so, he retained more self-control than me. It's fine, Sonny. Hook tried to calm me down. You'll be fine. Don't worry. But... 
I tried to protest, but Huck wouldn't hear any of it. I said, you'll be fine. Believe me, okay? With the answer approaching us slowly, I had no other alternative than to believe him and pray that he was right. He forced my head back down so low that my forehead touched the ground, but he got back up to his feet. I took short, scared glances at what was going on, but I was too afraid to do anything. Huck walked towards me, and it stopped when it saw him approach. Forgive him, Huck yelled. He's young. He didn't know what he was doing. Hearing his words, the answer paused. It lowered his head until its undead eyes were at Huck's level, but I could see the distrust in them, even from this far away. Give his punishment to me, Huck yelled. It's my fault for not teaching him better, and I'll make sure he won't repeat his mistake ever again. Huck, I yelled. You can't. Shut up, Huck yelled over his shoulder, but I didn't have the guts to look him in the eye. The answer walked up to him, and I saw him get down on his knees in front of it. I couldn't hold back anymore. I started crying. If the answer would have repaid my deed in kind, it would have mutilated Huck. The image of the deer's lower jaw pierced and ruined by my error flashed through my mind, followed by Huck bearing the same ugly injury, and it was too much for me to take. Huck lifted his head to look at it, and I saw one of Yanza's antlers droop lower until one of its many jaded tips rested against his jaw. But he didn't pull back. Hell, he didn't even flinch. No, I yelled, which made Yanza stop and look up at me. Shut, Huck began, but I stopped him. I was the one who did it, not him. You can't punish him for my mistake. Huck turned and looked at me, with desperation in his eyes, but I already decided not to let him go through with it, and I guess that Yansa saw the conviction in my eyes. He pushed Huck aside with his rotten snout and walked around him, stopping in front of me instead. The stench of his decay hit me hard, nearly sending me reeling when it invaded my senses. It was such an ugly and twisted being, and yet I couldn't feel a single trace of malice coming from it. No, the answer didn't want to bring me unwarranted suffering. He wanted justice. I'm sorry, I said, lowering my head to the ground once more. I really, truly am. I know I broke a trust and I deserve your punishment, but I'm sorry. A puff of putrid air left the answer's nostrils rolling over my features and nearly making me gag. I felt its head manoeuvre until its snout caressed my hair, and I tensed up as I got ready for what I thought would follow. My eyes closed shut, so tight that they pulled my face into a grimace. But the blow never came. Instead, I felt something sticky and slick probe the ground until it found my right hand. The answer's tongue enveloped my fingers, pulling them up, and I felt his jagged teeth nibble at my flesh. With a sickening crunch that sent bolts of pain radiating through my body, it bit my index finger off and swallowed it. I yelled out in pain, feeling blood welling from the wound, but Yansa didn't let me pull back. It got a grip on my hand and bit off my middle finger as well. The pain was so horrendous that I nearly passed out, but I somehow managed to remain conscious. I feared that it would go for another bite, that it would take my hand little by little as punishment, but it stopped at those two fingers and let me go. It got up and turned its back on me, shrinking as it retreated into the woods, until it was the size of a normal deer. I saw it look back at me one final time, not a single trace of the ugly monster that had chased me remained. Huck rushed to my side after Yansa left, pulling me to my feet and helping me inside his cabin. He busted out a first aid kit and did his best to patch me up before driving me to the closest town so a medic could have a proper look at it. I needed a lot of stitches, and the doctor also gave me a rabies vaccine just to be safe. As morning came and my condition was stable, the doctor released me. You got very lucky, Hug told me on the way back after I told him what I'd done to warrant Yance's wrath. Seeing his scarred face, finally understanding what had happened to him, I didn't find the statement hard to believe. Thank you, I said, for what you tried to do back there. Hook took me back to my cabin, but he kept an eye on me for as long as he could. 
He left Sunday evening like he was supposed to, and despite his insistence that I should leave too, I stayed. I couldn't explain it to him back then, and I still can't put into words to this day. But I'm not afraid of Yansa, or the forest. If anything, I've gained a deeper understanding and appreciation for it. Me and Huck are still friends to this day, by the way. I go out there whenever I can now, and we've been on countless hunts together. The least he deserves out of the ordeal is a friend. But the one thing that did change is how I now respect Yansa. And no matter where you are, I urge you to respect it as well. Believe me, you don't want to risk earning Yansa's wrath. The year was 2001. I was attending a neighborhood potluck at the local park with my wife and our newborn son we named Ashton. Our friends were elated upon learning we had our first and would be meeting Ashton for the first time that day. Everyone fussed over him and the adorable circular birthmark beneath his left eye, debating which of us he looked like more and how excited their kids were to have a new friend. There were about a dozen of us that occupied three picnic tables we had three or four coolers, a whole spread of different platters and trays that covered the entire table, along with burgers and hot dogs cooking on two charcoal grills. My cross street neighbour Fred grilled while everyone else talked, drank and played games. Ashton laid in his carriage, which I parked in the shade of an oak tree next to the grills. I kept Fred company while he cooked, acting as a sort of sous chef and making sure his drink was full. The park was particularly busy, and despite everything going on, I spotted someone who appeared to be watching our group, sitting alone at a picnic table about 10 yards from our spot. His clothes, stretchy black pants and a heavy looking hoodie that obscured his face were so uncharacteristic for a midsummer day and made him very noticeable. The hooded man sat facing us with his arms folded on the table. I pointed him out to Fred, who acknowledged something seemed off, but thought he appeared harmless. Maybe he's meeting someone, I suggested while pouring Fred a beer. Without any discretion, Fred turned and stared directly at the man. Could be, Fred said with disinterest while flipping a new burger. Maybe he got stood up. We'll fix him a plate to make him feel better. I rolled my eyes at Fred's remark, unable to resonate with his unapologetic apathy. I couldn't ignore my instincts that were telling me this guy was here for another reason. Nobody else seemed to notice or mind him, and I didn't want to put a damper on the gathering, so I kept quiet about my apprehensions. Despite being unable to see much of his face, I definitely felt the man's looming gaze briefly lock with mine a few times. After convincing myself he didn't have good intentions, I decided to confront this peculiar individual. Let's see what's up with this guy. I said softly to Fred. It's those newfound parental instincts kicking in, Fred said jokingly. They get a little wonky at first, just an FYI. I started towards the man's table, but froze upon hearing an ear-splitting crack, booming sound of shattering glass and crunching metal. Everyone in the park stopped and stared at the parking lot, where a large tree limb had broken and smashed two cars. The hell? Fred exclaimed as he set his spatula down and raced towards the scene. The tree limb fell on Fred's car, which mine was parked next to, and partially covered by the massive branch's leafy appendages. Throwing my arms up in the air, I released a, what the hell of my own, and followed behind Fred. Rachel was already assessing our car when I arrived, shuddering upon spotting a few good-sized scratches, dents, and windshield cracks. I expected Rachel to be as equally upset Instead, she gave me a perplexed stare. Where's the baby? She quickly asked. I immediately pivoted, instantly noticing the hooded man left his table and was beelining towards the grills. I broke into an all-out sprint upon determining the hooded man would reach Ashton first, releasing a boisterous hey that I hoped would deter him and get others to notice. What happened next took a matter of seconds but felt like it unraveled in slow motion. The hooded man, wearing thick padded gloves, 
removed one of the grill's metal grates and grabbed its side handles. He turned to me once more before lifting the grill and dumped the red hot coals into Ashton's carriage. A loud hiss like sizzle mixed as my baby's shrill, blood curdling shriek rang out, his screams only lasting two or three seconds before the carriage burst into flames. Grabbing handfuls of my hair as I reached Ashton's carriage, I could only scream his name and instinctively knock the stroller over with a firm kick. Glowing coals, charred blankets, pillows, and Ashton's smoldering remains spilled out, most of which was still on fire. The hooded man took off across the field while being pursued by Fred and two others. I could instantly tell Ashton was dead, whose stiff, crumpling body was completely doused in flames and produced a burnt aroma that filled my nostrils. I heard my wife's hysterical screams behind me as I felt my legs give out and collapse in a heap. Rachel was so inconsolable, she had to be sedated by the paramedics. I faded in and out, with most of the time between witnessing Ashton's murder and being taken to the hospital feeling like a blur. While waiting for an update on my wife, an officer came up to me and said they caught the hooded man, who initially escaped the park. I was brought to the police station, where I first laid eyes on him through a one-way mirror, while he sat in an interrogation room. The man's appearance was grotesque, and he had appalling physical deformities. His skin was light pinkish beige and littered with veiny, blotchy, grey and black growths. He was completely hairless and had dark yellow eyes, whose right one was about twice the size as his left. I was met with repulsion and boiling fury while gazing upon his murderous subhuman life form, whose windpipe I yearned to crush them like bare hands. After confirming I did not recognize him, detectives told me he was being classified as a John Doe. The hooded man had no form of identification, wasn't showing up on any databases, and hasn't spoken a word. After getting assured he wouldn't be released anytime soon, they asked me a few more questions before letting me go promising to provide updates on any new developments. I returned to the hospital, where Rachel was still being treated for a severe mental breakdown. I spent that night in the waiting room, mostly with my face buried in my cupped hands, replaying the day's grisly, life-altering events in my head. At some point, I dozed off, and was awoken the next morning by a nurse. She brought me to the doctor caring for Rachel, who said my wife was in a deep state of catatonic shock. After being updated on Rachel's condition, I returned home to start arranging Ashton's services. No sooner than taking three steps out of the hospital, however, I was stopped by the same officer who brought me to the police station yesterday. The officer looked distraught, who I could tell dreaded what he was about to say. He's gone, the officer said sorrowfully. Who's gone? I asked in bewilderment. The man who killed your baby. He somehow escaped last night. No witnesses, nothing on the camera, no signs of how. He was in his cell one minute and gone the next. The hooded man was never found. Rachel made little progress overcoming a debilitating trauma, spending the next year in and out of psychiatric care. My life consisted of work visiting Rachel at the hospital and going to bed. About two months passed, during which things continued to gradually implode. Rachel returned home, but was on a cocktail of meds that barely seemed to help. She became a bitter, hostile shell of her former self, barely capable of functioning independently, and prone to sporadic fits of rage, delirium, or emotional episodes. Rachel blamed me for our baby's death and made it her mission to keep me consistently reminded I reached my breaking point with Rachel when she used a broken bottle to attack me during one of her episodes, slicing my arm and neck, which required over a dozen stitches. After this incident, Rachel was put in a mental care facility, and I decided to explore my legal options for ending our marriage. She could be looked after by a family, I thought. Most of them also hated and blamed me for Ashton's death anyway, even saying I was responsible for Rachel's mental breakdown. My boss's wife connected me with a divorce attorney to look at my case. When I met him at his office, however, he said something that took me completely off guard. I've actually been expecting you, Mr. Williard, 
the attorney said, while rummaging through one of his desk drawers. I have something here with instructions. I give it to you on the 1st of September, which is today. He slid a yellow, manila envelope in front of me, which had my name in large black letters. Inside was a light grey envelope that also had my name handwritten on it in red ink. Who did it come from? I asked awkwardly. I only spoke to him twice, one year ago when he initially called, and last night when he reminded me about today. The attorney said, he just identified himself as Mr. Doe, sent me a large wad of cash to hold this for him, and that was that. Didn't ask any questions. That's sometimes how it is in this business. The envelope's letter contained a vertical list of numbers, with other sets of digits, words, or letters beneath each one, and were written in the following order. 9, 112, 001, 11, 77, 175, 93. Next paragraph. 12, 262, 004, 758, 91. Next paragraph. 342, 012, 700 UTC, capital. Next paragraph. 842, 020, NH4, NO3, 4. 132-029-1997 XF11 Skin The Manila envelope also held a white CD with Watch in Order written across its surface. I didn't even get done what I originally came to the attorney for, becoming completely sidetracked by the mysterious package. I ran the CD on my computer, which had a handful of video files labelled 1 through 5. Remembering the disc said Watch in Order, I opened the first file. My heart stopped when the video began playing. Appearing on screen was the deformed face of my baby's killer. The man who murdered my baby sat in a concrete room, wearing the same heavy hoodie and black stretch pants as he did that day. I would have pulled my computer off the desk and thrown it across the room if the shock from seeing his hideous face didn't numb me to a state of borderline paralysis. After fiddling with the camera, the hooded man leaned back and stared intently into the lens. I'm so sorry, Jeremy, he said in a low, gruff voice, causing sharp chills to race down my spine when he spoke my name. I really am so sorry, so sorry for everything, but you must understand why this happened. Let me start from the beginning. I took sharp breaths and struggled to maintain my composure, but felt compelled to continue watching. My name obviously isn't Mr. Doe, it's Arek, and I'm from the year 2067. I know it sounds absurd, but you have something that will prove what I'm telling you is true. The man who identified himself as Arek leaned closer towards the camera. Just know this was for a greater good, and doing this actually saved countless lives. I leaned back and stared skeptically at the computer screen, my intensifying hatred for this man clashing with a queasy uneasiness ushered in when he admitted to being the Mr. Doe from whom I received the package. Okay, now that I've got your attention, here's where it gets complicated, Eric continued. Some years from now, I can't get into specifics, a catastrophe is going to occur that devastates the world. Among the most adverse ramifications are a series of physical mutations a portion of the population undergoes, as you can clearly see. Eric gestured towards his deformed face. We're known as defects and require special treatment to stay alive, like routine radiation doses and staying within certain temperature ranges, just to mention a few. Cases of radiation contamination and new disease outbreaks originating from defects turned us into pariahs. Eric sighed. This is where your son comes in. During these times, we call Ashton Williard the Damasciant. He was a renowned public figure whose faction quickly rose to power in the cataclysm's aftermath, feeding off people's manipulable emotions and fears. Seeking a scapegoat amidst their promises to rebuild, the Damax, as his minions were called, set their sights on the defects. They succeeded in generating enough widespread hatred against us, even going as far as to stage violent attacks and pinning us as the culprits. The video had me completely engaged. 
The Demakiant cited these attacks and our susceptibility to infect and contaminate people as grounds to start rounding us up into containment camps. We knew the risks we posed towards the unaffected portion of the population and took great pains to isolate and care for ourselves while researchers worked tirelessly to discover a cure. Eric hung his head. They actually came close, but the programs were discontinued without explanation. The camps had inhumane conditions. Many died from disease or malnourishment before the Tamax began extermination. The things they did would make history's most heinous figures cringe. You'll see what I mean when you watch the other files. I lost everyone in those camps, Jeremy. Doing this was the only way to reverse that and end the Demachian suppressive reign. I felt a lump form in my throat and held back tears, simultaneously empathizing with Eric, while still reluctant to believe his story. Your son was ravenous for power. The Demax invasively occupied territory, eventually starting a multinational war. They killed millions of defects, but those numbers pale in comparison to the tens of millions who perished just in the war alone. A few tears streamed down Eric's face. It's okay to talk about what your son would have become since that timeline is being eliminated. As for why I killed him in such a gruesome manner, doing it on that exact moment and way was the only option to stably alter the timeline. My heart sank while I recalled that fateful day, particularly when the tree limb fell in our cars. It was the perfect distraction. Did Eric know that would happen? Did he change time to make that branch break, knowing how immediately it would occupy my attention? Jeremy, I know you're probably having a hard time believing this. I would too. But think about how I just vanished from my cell. I'd love to explain how it works, but it's against the rules to directly reveal certain information. Eric held up a light grey envelope with my name written in red ink, the same one I received. That's why I sent you this. There are clues for the events that will occur in the future, which will verify this is very real. Think of it as a puzzle. It's actually quite easy once you figure it out. There's some considerable time between each instance, but don't worry, I'll send you reminders. I know you're hurt, confused and angry right now, but please believe me when I say a great loss or tragedy is sometimes necessary to prevent something much worse from happening. After the video ended, I stared at the computer for what felt like hours. Tearing, perspiring and trembling, I had no idea what to believe. After recollecting myself, I watched the other videos, which were compilations of newspaper clippings, excerpts from news broadcasts and raw footage depicting scenes of war and unfathomable carnage. They seemed to map out everything Eric described, mentioning the cataclysm, defects, Demax rise to power and their imperialistic campaign. Headlines like Experts, recovery will take a few years, over 10k new mutation cases confirmed, link between defects and contamination outbreak identified, and the max complete southern coast occupation caught my eye. More videos and pictures flashed on the screen that Eric's words did little justice in describing. I saw images of war-torn horizons and crumbled city skylines, explosions, scores of marching or fighting soldiers, along with dead and dismembered bodies. The most disturbing scenes showed defects performing hard labour, rooms with their bodies and severed limbs hanging from meat hooks, mass executions and graves, even some getting their deformities cut off or experimented on while still conscious. It didn't take long for me to deduce a robust, prominent looking man donning a black authoritative uniform and long overcoat, who I saw clips of making fiery speeches, getting paraded around while waving to crowds, speaking with officers, other official looking figures and transported by armed security details. It was my son. Despite having his mother's eyes, Ashton bore an overwhelming striking resemblance to me. But what indisputably verified my son's identity was the birthmark still visible beneath his left eye. Despite the macabre prospects of his future, I was initially proud of my son, which I suppose comes natural for any parent, until I reminded myself what he would have turned into a genocidal warlord whose totalitarian regime appeared to deepen the world's state of ruin. I stopped watching after one scene of Ashton making a passionate speech, when I noticed an elderly man and woman sitting in the background. They were huddled closely together and gazed upon Ashton, 
the faces containing conflicted expressions of admiration and obligatory supportiveness, along with disappointment, concern, and dismay. My jaw dropped, and I released a gasp like yelp, before abruptly closing the video. Rachel and I were that elderly couple. Experiencing a wave of smothering lightheadedness, I tried pouring myself a drink, only to violently regurgitate it while standing over the sink. Those videos looked so genuine, and I hated how everything Eric said arguably made sense. Was my son really destined to become this monstrous tyrant? Was this some elaborate sadistic prank a deranged individual was orchestrating to gain pleasure at the expense of my suffering? I tried thinking of every conceivable explanation to not believe, but couldn't be convinced. My attention shifted to the notes, series of numbers that meant nothing upon review. Remembering Eric said to think of it as a puzzle, I looked at the first set of characters. 9, 112, 001, 1177, 17593. What are you trying to tell me here? I asked out loud. There must be something more to this. About one week later, I received an identical light grey envelope in the mail. It contained a handwritten letter, also in red ink, that simply read 9112001, just reminding you. I spent weeks trying to crack the cryptic code, which consumed me for months to no avail. It would take me over three years to finally figure it out when the next letter arrived. After finalizing my divorce with Rachel, I moved back to my home state and reconnected with an old high school sweetheart. We got engaged, were starting our own company, and in the process of purchasing a house, I was grateful to finally move on with my life. But despite getting closure on Ashton's death, still kept the indecipherable letters. Christmas was five days away, and I returned home from gift shopping when I found a light grey envelope lying on my doormat. Despite immediately knowing what it was, the envelope's mere sight flooded my head with memories of Ashton's screams, his burning carriage, and Eric's unendurable face. I shakily opened the envelope to find another letter, which read, 12262004. Do you believe me yet? On the first letter, written under 12262004 with the numbers 75891. This time around, however, I was more concerned Eric knew where I lived than solving this mystery. I was about to dial 911, but remembered when Eric said he'd be sending me reminders and decided to play along, feeling certain this letter was his latest. I figured everything out a few days later, ironically while writing a final check to my divorce lawyer. It was the day after Christmas, and I had the news on while paying some bills. They were talking about a massive earthquake and tsunami that devastated coastal communities across the Indian Ocean. I was so distracted by the story, I almost put the comma of the check's numerical amount in the wrong spot. While stopping myself, I looked at the check's date, which read December 26th, 2004. Remembering I was anticipating something significant to happen, I grabbed the original letter and stared closely at the number. 12262. 004. Thinking about the same mistake I almost made on the check, I rewrote the figure and shifted the second comma one digit to the left, so it now read 12 26 2004. I did the same with the top number, going from 9 112 001 to 9 11 2001, which was when it became clear. They were dates. It was something the news anchor said that I happened to hear. The earthquake registered a 9.1 on the Richter scale. That drew my stare to the numbers beneath 12, 262, 004, which were 758 and 91. Then it came to me. 91 signified the earthquake's magnitude. I learned the quake happened 7.58am local time, which I linked to the other number, 758. Solving the 9, 112, 001 figures was even more unsettling. The date it translated to was obvious, and, after doing some research, deduced the other numbers represented the flight numbers of each aircraft involved. I started shaking when the reality of this revelation hit me, almost having a nervous breakdown when I couldn't fathom any other way that Eric, or whoever this was, could have known this information. 
my perceptions of reality, space and time were turned upside down, marking a day that forever changed my life. I still resented Eric for killing my baby and will always keep Ashton's memory alive because I remember him as an adorable, innocent baby who didn't hurt or wrong a single soul. Having said that, I finally understood what Eric meant. I translated the last three numbers. 3, 42, 012 became March 4th, 2012. 8, 42, 020 turned into August 4th, 2020. And 4, 132, 029 was April 13th, 2029. Despite the tragic nature of the events that already happened, I understood why Eric chose them specifically. They mostly happened by pure chance and could not have been predicted or prevented. Having said that, I've spent the last 15 years making vain efforts at determining what happens on each of these dates before the events unfold, with hopes of preventing a tragedy. As expected, I received my next letter over seven years later in late winter of 2012. 342012. I know you don't need these reminders anymore, but sent this one just in case was what I read. Under 342012 on the original letter I received over a decade ago, 700 UTC and capital were written. On March 4th, 2012, a series of deadly explosions caused by an arms dump rocked Brazzaville, capital city of the Republic of Congo. The blast started around 8am local time, which translated to 7 coordinated universal time, otherwise known as UTC. That made sense. The most recent event happened this past summer. My next letter arrived the last week of July, which said, 842020. See you soon. Don't do anything stupid. I'll be watching. I obsessed over what this meant, unsure how it pertained to the next event I expected to occur on August 4th. Beneath 842020 on the original letter were the terms NH4N03 and port whose meanings I could only speculate until the actual event transpired. I'm sure most of us remember the explosion that happened in Beirut, Lebanon. Port signified where the blast happened, the port of Beirut. This one took me a while, but I figured out NH4NO3 was the chemical formula for ammonium nitrate which caused the deadly explosion. There's a good amount of time between now and the last event, which should be on April 13th, 2029 after translating it from the numerical figure of 4132029. Beneath it on the original letter, that I still have after all these years, the phrases 1997X F11 and skin are written. I have no idea what they're foreshadowing and probably won't until the actual day. I've kept this knowledge of the future away from my then fiancé, who's now my wife for 14 years. We have a thriving company under us, along with a house and two beautiful children. The letters and their connection to Ashton's death are tied to a completely different part of my past that my family was not involved in or has much knowledge about, and I intended to keep it that way. Until we met our new neighbours. They were a very nice couple from the northeast that relocated for the husband, Corey's job. They have one child who is around the same age as our kids that have gotten along famously, along with a two-month-old baby boy. Looking back, I think I understand now what the most recent letter I received meant. The name of my neighbour's newborn son is Eric. The following is a transcript of the contents of a spiral-bound notebook in the custody of law enforcement in connection with a pending investigation. While the investigation and most of the events described did occur in the general vicinity of the Midwest, all of the specific locations, names and other identifiers have been altered by me to protect the investigation and my own anonymity. I will be similarly circumspect about how I obtain access to the notebook itself. Suffice to say, I had an opportunity to analyse the object physically. As part of that process, I photographed all the pages per my SOP. It wasn't until the following week that I glanced back through those photos and began reading out what I have collected. I understand how this may be interpreted, and you have no reason to trust the word of an anonymous stranger 
as to its authenticity. I cannot even vouch for the truth of what is written myself, though I think I have transcribed all the words accurately. All I can say is that what I have written is the truth, and I am presenting it to the best of my ability. What you take from it, evidence of something sinister, the outlines of some elaborate prank, or simply a few moments of entertainment, that is entirely up to you. I remember the first time I saw you. You were, what, one? Maybe not even that. Laying on the blanket next to your mama in the park, sleeping so peacefully as she watched over you with a tired but happy look on her face. That sleep, so calm and serene. I envied you of that. I was having trouble sleeping, even back then, and every day I could feel the last scraps of that kind of peace being taken away from me. I don't want you to misunderstand me though. Me talking about not sleeping and envying a little baby that can. Well, you might think that I was jealous of you. Hated you even. But no. Nothing could be further from the truth. I saw that little pink ball of innocence. That bright little light of life that hadn't been kicked down by the world quite yet. And I loved you. I loved you for what you were. And what you could be. So, I decided to take you under my wing. Pa had once called me a witch. A witch? I tried telling that guy that I wasn't no witch, and even if I was, you'd call a boy witch a warlock. But he got that mean, sour look he'd sometimes get before I was five words in, and I knew the hit was coming before he even started to swing. I just balled up then. I was fifteen at the time, and I might have fought back, but... He was bigger and stronger and meaner than me, and if I fought back, it'd just be worse. So instead, I balled right up like a little armadillo, and before long, it was over. Armadillos are funny. They look cute and all, sure, like little knights in suits of armour or something. But you know, a lot of them have leprosy under their armour, a poison rot like the olden times right under their skin. I felt like that back then like I had poison welling up under that skin he was bruising and splitting, waiting for the right time to reach out and touch him, wither him right away. Except, my poison wasn't leprosy. Mine was what I could see, what I knew. I could look at my father, big, strong man that he was, and I could see the thread of his life stretching out in front of him. Not everything, you understand. It was until later that I got where I could focus more and see particulars I wanted to see, but enough to know the biggest goods and bads he had coming, enough to see when and how that thread would be cut for good. That was why he was afraid of me, why he hated me so. I would made the mistake of letting on what I could see before I knew it was better to hide it. Pa tried to ignore it at first, but that changed when I came to him crying one morning found him in the field, working on that old tractor that crapped out at least once a season, already in an awful temper. I should have known better, but I was scared and upset, and I loved him. I thought if I told him how he was going to die, he could avoid it, and I wanted that more than just about anything. Funny thing was, when what I saw finally came true a few years later, the biggest thing that I felt was relief. Relief that it was over, and that my poison had finally finished the job. I know what you're thinking. I'm being arrogant, thinking I can play God, thinking that my visions are killing people when, just by listening to what I've said, you could tell I'm just seeing what's coming for somebody, and even warning them doesn't change a thing. For a long time, I thought that way too. As I got older, and especially after Pa passed, I got stronger in what I could see, but I wanted to see it less and less. I couldn't help people, and seeing people that way, like a bunch of choices they hadn't made yet, it made it hard to see them as people at all. They were just numbers and symbols, and I felt like some egghead mathematician looking at some humongous formula on a blackboard. Except, I liked people, and I hated math, and the world was getting so much I couldn't be around someone for more than a few minutes without seeing the worst things they would do, and how it would all end. I learned to block it some, but just enough that I didn't go crazy. 
and that was before I started losing sleep. We weren't meant to be in this world all this time, I'm convinced of it. This world. It's a hard place with sharp edges, and it'll whittle you down to nothing if you don't leave it once in a while. That's why God gave us sleep and dreams. Some people say that those dreams are as real as this world, realer even. And maybe that's so, or maybe not. I don't know. What I do know is that we aren't meant to stay here all the time, especially when you see everything that I see. When I first saw that little baby you, I guess something came over me. Maybe it was some instinct, some part of whatever this power is that I have. I like to think that it was something more though, that even then I wanted to keep you safe forever. I spent the next hour looking through the thread of your life, the times you were truly scared or truly happy, the things that shaped you or pushed you this way or that, when you felt love and when you were in danger, the day when you were just 19, that you died. By the time your mama picked you up and carried you back to the car, my head was splitting and I was close to bawling. I could see how it happened and why, but not how to stop it. Telling you, even if I waited 18 years to tell you the day it happened, wouldn't be enough to stop it. Our lives, our fates, they have movement, inertia, and you are heading toward a coffin like a bullet flying past. Me telling you stuff you wouldn't believe would be too late to help anything. Well, I might as well be puffing out of breath at that passing bullet. It won't change where it hits one little bit. But what if I didn't talk to you just then? What if I talked to you for years? Proved to you that what I saw was real and that you could trust me. Maybe that belief would be enough that you would listen when the time was right. I followed you and your mama home that day and I've kept track of you ever since. Those first few years, I would only see you every now and then, checking your thread for any changes, looking into more details so I could understand you better. The rest of the time, I spent doing little experiments with other people, seeing if I could move their threads at all. Turns out, I can. But it's not an easy thing. That momentum I was talking about, it's a powerful thing. And if you warn someone or keep them from doing something they were meant to do, the universe has a funny way of self-correcting. I've seen odd stuff over the years, much of it I don't understand, and the strangest thing has to be the way that creation will bend over backwards to return a person to the path they're meant to be on. I'm talking about coincidences, or things that even go beyond that, that just seem to happen to make sure someone lives or dies, that they meet a particular person or learn a particular thing. I don't claim to get why it does what it does, but it didn't take long for me to understand what it meant to me. This force, this momentum, whether you want to call it fate or destiny or magic elves in the trees, it was working against me and what I was trying to do. It was the opposition, the enemy, the bad guy, and for a while, I didn't know if I could beat it. And then one day, I did. It was a guy named Lenny. Nice enough guy, I guess. But more importantly, he worked in the building across from my job and ate lunch outside most days. It gave me easy access to him. And after a few months, I had most of his next 20 years mapped out in my head. The key to most of it was him meeting the woman he'd marry. Her name was Laura. Before meeting her, his life was pretty bare. He didn't like himself. And because of that, he didn't like most people. Meeting her changed all of that. I'm not saying their life together was perfect, because it wasn't, but they brought out the best in each other. I could see several points in his life where he picked right instead of left because of his love for her, and because of this, he avoided several traps the world might have thrown in his path. Looking at his life, I knew I'd found something special. Everyone is affected by others, but to find a life so impacted by how it touches another, that's a lot more rare. And if I was ever going to have a chance of proving I could affect things, I'm saving you. This was it. And for a wonder, it worked. It took time and effort and sacrifice, but it worked. And from that, I came up with my plan to protect you. I'm writing this two days before your 12th birthday. 
when you find this notebook, which I know you will, it will have a green notebook rubber band to it. That is the story of your life from age 12 to 13. It is long, but I try to organize it well and only use words you'll understand. If you find one you don't, go get the dictionary off your mom's bookshelf and look it up. You need to get all of this, okay? I don't cover everything, of course. It would take way too long to write or read, but it's about 30 pages of little things and big things that are going to happen and what happens because of those things. I give you the date and time when I can, but I can't see that clear except occasional. And there's only a couple of times when I tell you what you should do instead of what you're meant to do. For now, I just want you to understand that what I'm telling you will come true and that you can trust me. Every year, I'm going to give you another green book. I'll tell you what you need to know, when you need to pick path B instead of path A, that kind of thing. I'll keep watch on the road ahead of you and make sure you stay safe for as long as I'm able. I'm convinced that if you listen to me, we can beat that day when you're 19. I know this is a lot to understand and believe, but I've already seen that you will. I can't see your thread moving yet, but I think in time, as you know more and trust more, that will get easier. I know you're a smart girl, so this probably doesn't need to be said, but don't tell anybody about these notebooks or what you know. Take it from me, all it will do is make people think you're crazy and that you're wrong somehow. Just keep it to yourself and use it as you will. It's still your life after all. I'm just here to make sure you get to live it. Signed, your guardian angel. That is the end of the primary writing in the red notebook. There is, however, loose paper in the back of the notebook that appear to be from a different source as the lines are different in size and spacing. Based upon the content and the apparent age of the pages and the ink, it seems this was written much more recently. I used to think of people as strings, seeing how inevitable everything was. It always felt like we were being pulled along, just a dumb piece of string, until we finally get cut. But then I met Lenny and the others, and I realized I could change that string if I worked hard enough. Twist it this way or that, lengthen it or cut it shorter than intended. It made me feel special, powerful even, but more importantly, it meant that I could guide you through a safe and happy life. For years, it worked. I got you past you suffocating at 19, and then past the two times the universe tried to correct itself over the next few months, and then I saw you headed toward that fire at 30. I stopped it from ever happening at all. I wrapped your life in bubble wrap, and I think you used to appreciate it. I know you did, but lately, you take it all for granted. You think that I'm manipulating you somehow, or that you don't need me anymore. You have no idea of the vicious things the world has waiting for you at every turn, of how many times I've fought those things off for you. You have no idea of how things will change if you keep ignoring my advice like this. The thing is, you're wrong. It's always been your choice. I used to not believe in free will, but I was wrong. I see that now. You can steer your life how you want, but make no mistake, free will does not mean you won't be pushed and pulled. That universe that's been wanting to hurt and kill you all these years is just waiting for the chance to put you back on its course. Some version of things where you're miserable or scared or dead and left to your own devices, you'll steer right into it. I can see that now. And the worst part of it is, I'm no different than you. I never told you why I don't sleep much. It's because of the nightmare. The same nightmare I've had for nearly 40 years. It's always terrified me though, when I was younger. I thought it was just a dream. Even when I recognized you in it, I told myself it was just my brain's way of expressing my fear that I might fail you someday. It wasn't until the last few years that I've come to accept that the dream is the rapidly approaching future, or at least one version of what may come to pass. In it, you're in a large room with no windows and soundproofing on the walls. You're laying in bed asleep, though the IV running into your arm makes me think you have little choice in that. Three years ago, I didn't know where that place was or what drugs I was feeding you. Now, I own that place and have enough medical supplies stockpiled to last 10 years or more. That's not fate. 
Not really. I saw those choices, but I still chose to make them. I couldn't say it's all out of my hands, but I love you too much to lie. No, the truth is better. And the truth is, well, part of the truth is that I've run out of options to keep you safe. For all my planning and advice, all my study of the story of you, you're still the author. And when you decide to refuse my help, I have to make a choice to either leave you to make your own mistakes or take control of things once and for all. I know you want me to just leave you alone, and while that hurts, I guess I understand it too. No one wants to be bossed around or feel like their life isn't their own. But you have to understand, I feel the same way. I didn't ask for this power, I never wanted to see what I do. The dark, secret hearts of people, the sharp, biting teeth of the world, the same damn dream that is so terrible and so wonderful at the same time. Because you're not alone in that room. There is another bed, and on it, I lay, sleeping. This isn't the ragged, sweaty, screaming sleep of a man ripping himself from a nightmare, only to be plunged back into the too sharp world. No, my breath is even, my face unlined by worry or fear. I'm not drugged or knocked out either. Just sleeping the blissfully peaceful sleep of the innocent, much like a baby might on a warm day in spring. I need that. We need that. I've done what I can to protect you while letting you be free. And once you're with me, I swear I'll always care for you during my waking hours. You'll never suffer again. I've seen your thread, and I know this will work. I will keep you from the teeth of the world, and in turn, you will give me the dreamless escape I've lived without for so long. We will both be free and happy and together. And that will be the story of us. <laughs>